Welcome to the January 13th, 2023 Licensing Committee meeting. Uh, my name is Wendy Strack, I'm chair of the committee. Uh, before we convene, I'd like to remind everyone present that the board is a consumer protection agency charged with administering and enforcing the board's laws. Where the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. The meeting today is conducted consistent with the provisions of government code section 11133. I will announce when we are accepting public comment on the various issues and the meeting moderator will open the lines as appropriate. Uh, each commentator will have two minutes to complete their comments. Uh, before we begin, um, I'd like to note that we'll be taking some of the agenda items out of order. Agenda items five and eight will come before item four. Uh, so that'll be items three, five, and eight first, uh, then we'll return to four and, and proceed through the remaining items. Uh, so moderator, would you please provide the audience instructions on how they might participate during the meeting at the appropriate time? Certainly. At the time of public comment, we will display instructions as we are displaying now. Those in the attendance by WebEx can look for the a question mark icon, typically in the lower right of your WebEx screen. If once you click that, it will open up a text box. You can put the word comment or I would like to make a comment and click send. That will inform us that you have your hand raised. The other option is to click on the hand icon and that will also put you in the queue to make a comment. And if you are a dial-in user, you can press star three to raise your hand. And each person will have two minutes at that point. We will mute your microphone and move on to the next commenter. Thank you, moderator. Um, I'd like to now officially call the meeting to order and ask Christina to uh, do a roll call to establish a quorum. Good morning. Susan Friedman. Good morning, present. Wendy Strack. Good morning, Wendy Strack, public member. Eleanor Uribe. Eleanor, you're muted. Could you unmute? Sorry. Okay, Eleanor Uribe, board member, present. Thank you. Dr. Annette Walker. Yeah, hello, everyone, and happy new year. Dr. Annette Walker, public board member, present. And we have a quorum. Thank you, uh, Christina. Um, before we begin, I want to remind all speakers uh, to remain on topic when making comments on the agenda items. And then the first one uh, we're going to go through today is the uh, consent calendar uh, with the uh, approval, possible approval of November 19th, uh, 2021 committee meeting minutes. Um, does any member wish to remove any items from the consent calendar? Seeing none, um, do we have a motion for the consent calendar? And I may be the only one on this committee who was present at that, so I'll make the motion, but um, we probably do need uh, a second, even if you weren't there. <laughs> Thank you, Annette. Yes, and, and just to follow up on your comment, it should, I guess you really already noted it, but to note that this is a new, um, we, there are new members joining this committee. And like you said, I think you are the only one that was present for the the uh, notes that we're approving at this time. Mm -hmm. That's, that is correct. Thank you. I just like to um, note that the slide for the consent calendar states that this is for November 19, 2022 committee minutes. Uh, the agenda reflects the correct date, November 19, 2021. So I just want to make sure that we're going to make the correct motion for the, the year of those minutes. Yes, that would be great if the motion included the date. So we had that um, correct. And yes, you're correct. You can vote and you can have a motion on such minutes, even though you were not present at the meeting, you're just approving the record of the meeting and you would rely on, of course, your other board members who were present that it was correct and staff, of course, but we're just approving the record of the meeting. Okay, so then I'll uh, restate the motion then to approve the November 19th, 2021 committee meeting minutes. Great. And Dr. Walker will second. Thank you. 
Um, are there any comments from the public? This is the moderator and we are opening up the WebEx Q&A option to facilitate public comment. You can look for the question mark icon in the lower right of your computer screen or behind the three dot other options if you are on a smartphone, the smartphone app, or if you are a call-in user, you can press star three to raise your hand. And anyone can raise their hand by clicking on the hand icon. Are there any comments on the minutes and the motion? And I see no requests for public comment. Shall I close that feature? Yes, you may close. Thank you. Okay, uh, with not seeing any public comment, um, Christina, you call for the vote. Thank you. Susan Friedman. Abstain. Wendy Strack. Yes. yes. Eleanor Uribe. Uribe. Eleanor? Yes. yes. Dr. Annette Walker? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Christina. Um, next on the agenda, uh, we have item five, um, and we have a uh, presentation on behavioral health workforce challenges. Uh, Steve, would you like to introduce our guest speaker? Yes, hi. Um, so uh, Dr. Sergio Aguilar Gasiola has, uh, has um, made some time for us today, and I think um, his presentation is kind of a kickoff to what we're looking at for workforce development. Um, Dr. Aguilar Gasiola, he's a professor of clinical internal medicine, director of the Center for Reducing Health Disparities for the UC Davis, um, UC Davis Medicine um, UC Davis School of Medicine. I apologize, doctor. Um, so I, you know, I think this is going to be a great way to kick off what we're looking at for workforce, and he should be able to um, present some really good information for us. So um, Dr. Aguilar, this is uh, your chance. Yeah, thank you, uh, Steve, uh, and good morning to everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to share some uh, uh, information. Uh, le let me see if I can. Uh, how do I? Do, how do I? If I can uh, show yes. my slides. Yes. One moment while I get the correct PowerPoint up. And Steve, as a reminder, if you would be so kind as to put yourself on mute. Thank you. That will take care of the echo. All right. So I've got the correct PowerPoint displaying, and now I am pushing the presenter privileges to Dr. Aguilar Gaciola. Okay, thank you so much. I see that now. Uh, so this is the topic that I will be addressing uh, is to provide uh, an overview of uh, California's behavioral health workforce and to speak a, a little bit about challenges and, and recommendations. And this is what I'm hoping to cover today is uh, who constitutes the behavioral health uh, workforce, uh, California's behavioral health uh, workforce challenges, uh, also the workforce in behavioral health occupations, and uh, 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 differences uh, in the distribution of behavioral health uh, providers by region, age, and racial and ethnic uh, uh, factors and also uh, supply and demand for psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, LMFTs, LPCCs, and LCWs, and uh, a little bit about the workforce pipeline, and then to uh, share with you a, a conclusion and a set of recommendations. And before I, I, I start with you is to, um, um, most likely you are aware of this, uh, uh, in my opinion, seminal work, landmark work, that the California Future Health uh, Workforce Commission did uh, uh, you know, for 18 months. Uh, this was work that was kick, kicked off. Uh, it was launched uh, in uh, 2017, and it lasted uh, for uh, 18 months, as I mentioned to you. And also, uh, 
there were there were several uh, reports uh, coming out of that uh, uh, of, of this high level um, commission. The commission charge uh, was to develop uh, a strategic plan for building the future uh, health workforce, and it's meant to last uh, uh, for this uh, whole decade that we are uh, uh, now and to provide practical short, medium, and long-term solutions for California education and employers uh, to address uh, the workforce gaps. It was led by uh, the co-chairs, uh, Janet Napolitano, who at, that, at the time was the president of, uh, of uh, the UC system, and Lloyd Dean, that uh, uh, continues to be the CEO of Dignity Health, also now is called Common Spirit. It was comprised of 24 senior level leaders in education, labor, industry, and government. And the, the, the commission focused their, their work in three different areas, uh, primary care and prevention, behavioral health, and aging. And I wanna emphasize that behavioral health was one of the primary, the, the, one of the areas of focus. Uh, there were uh, it, 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 24 commissioners, as I mentioned, 40 technical advisory committee members, and three subcommittees. Uh, I, I was a member of the technical advisory committee uh, that feed, uh, feeded, uh, inform, fed information uh, to the commission. And also, I was the chair, co-chair, actually, of the Behavioral Health Subcommittee. And this is important because a lot of information that I will present to you is coming from that work. Uh, the report came up with uh, uh, 27 recommendations, uh, and the commissioners prioritized 10 recommendations based on the urgency and the potential for impact. And that resulted in top 10 recommendations required that require an investment of $3 billion over 10 years. And the full package of the 27 recommendations and each of them had a specific proposal uh, would cost uh, $6 billion uh, over uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, in sum, uh, there were more than 115 individuals from 80 organizations that generated solutions. Very comprehensive, uh, comprehensive uh, report. And and uh, it's important uh, for me once again uh, to uh, uh, bring your attention and awareness of this particular uh, uh, set of documents. And I share with Steve uh, the final report and also the executive uh, summary that uh, I'm hoping, Steve, that uh, you will pass that on to the, to the, board, the, to the board members. So the first, the first uh, topic is who constitutes the behavioral health workforce? Well, you can see the list on the screen. Uh, behavioral health clinicians, psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, licensed clinical social workers, licensed professional counselors, marriage and family therapists, psychiatric nurse practitioners, uh, etc. And uh, this, uh, even though this is uh, a comprehensive list, it doesn't include all uh, the workforce, uh, behavioral health workforce, because there are some uh, some uh, 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 unlicensed uh, workers that uh, also uh, uh, practice in 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 this uh, in in, uh, in under behavioral health uh, workforce. This is just to give you a sense uh, uh, of uh, uh, the, the specific disciplines with the credentials, qualifications, and their practice, and also whether they are able to uh, prescribe psychotropic uh, medications, if they are uh, trained to provide psychological testing, uh, also uh, you know, to do treatment planning, therapy, case management, Etc. Rehab as well. Uh, I would uh, uh, encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, at your leisure when you have access, when you you get the slides as well. 
But these are uh, the, in, in general, the behavioral health occupations. These are divided uh, into licensed professions. Uh, you can see the list there. Uh, certified professions. Uh, you can see substance use disorder counselors, peer providers, and then the unlicensed occupations. And you can see the list there as well. One thing that is important to keep in, in consideration is that the unlicensed occupations, if we think about that triangle, the base of the triangle are the unlicensed occupations, the majority of those uh, 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 you know, that comprise the workforce. The certified professions are in the middle, and the tip of the triangle are the licensed uh, professions. Just to give you a sense of uh, the uh, numbers uh, of mental health professionals or behavioral health professionals, this is uh, back to 2020, which is the, the most recent data that I was able to, uh, to uh, obtain, that the greatest majority are marriage and family therapists, uh, followed by clinical social workers, psychologists, psychiatric technicians, and psychiatrists, uh, you know, are in short supply, you know, 4,000 and, and uh, almost uh, 500,000 uh, people in, in California. Uh, this is another way of uh, uh, describing the distribution of licensed behavioral health professionals. As you can see, uh, 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 most of the pie uh, uh, is taken once again by the LMFPs, uh, followed by uh, by LCSWs, and psychiatrists uh, comprise four percent of the licensed behavioral health uh, professionals in California. Uh, if I speak a little bit about uh, psychiatrists, there is a a very uh, uneven distribution of psychiatrists by region. And this is uh, the, the, me the uh, measurement unit that is used for this is uh, the number of psychiatrists per 100,000 uh, Californians. Uh, this is the most recent data that I, I could find. Uh, and, and that is, uh, if, if you see that, that the greater Bay Area uh, has more than twice as, as uh, uh, the staff uh, of Orange County, Northern and Sierra, uh, and, and Inland Empire, and the San Joaquin Valley. The San Joaquin Valley, as you can see at the bottom of, of, uh, uh, of this uh, diagram, uh, are uh, with, in, with very few, uh, relatively few uh, psychiatrists uh, by, uh, you know, per uh, 100,000 uh, population. This is, uh, uh, you know, something similar to what you saw, uh, but this is specifically for the behavioral health professions, excluding psychiatrists. And as you can see, uh, uh, I'm highlighting in uh, this rectangle in uh, green that the Greater Bay Area they have an overrepresentation. Uh, the rates uh, were higher than the state average for almost all of the professions shown. While the Inland Empire and San Joaquin uh, Valley regions had rates that were lower than average for almost all of the professions shown. You know, this is uh, an important highlight. And if you are asking the question, well, uh, which counties comprise each of the uh, regions listed? This is the map. So you can see here, uh, what goes into uh, the uh, greater Bay Area region, the central coast, uh, 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 et cetera. Um, the, the other thing that is uh, important to mention is the age distribution that is uneven as well. Uh, in the three behavioral professional, in three behavioral health professionals, uh, professions, over 20% of the workforce is 60 years old or older. As you can see there, psychiatrists, clinical and counseling psychologists, and married, marriage and family therapists, you know, they, they are uh, uh, older. And with, uh, uh, unfortunately, with the experience with COVID, uh, it is likely that retirement uh, is gonna be happening earlier, you know, so, 
uh, that's going to have an impact on the workforce as well. On the other hand, in one profession, 35% uh, of the workforce are young and they're age 30 years of age. And this is specifically substance abuse disorder uh, counselors. This is the distribution by race and ethnicity uh, by, for psychiatrists. And as you can see here, the greatest majority uh, are uh, white uh, and uh, you know, Latinos uh, are 25%, while uh, the representation in the population is 40%. And you can see with blacks, they are way underrepresented as well in relationship to the representation in the population, 3%. And in the population, they are roughly about 7%. Uh, this is race ethnicity, once again, by non-prescribing behavioral health professionals. Uh, and as you can see here, it, by each of the professions uh, that the clinical uh, counseling psychologists, the MFTs, the counselors, the social workers, and also the substance abuse counselors are uh, 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 kind of overrepresented uh, by uh, uh, by uh, 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 whites, uh, 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 except uh, perhaps the substance abuse counselors that is uh, reaching, you know, uh, the representation in the population. Uh, but in case of uh, Latinos, as you can see, they are way underrepresented, uh, uh, with tremendous, tremendous disparities in relationship. Uh, to their uh, how uh, the proportion that they have in the in the population once again. This is uh, the projected demand and supply for psychiatrists uh, from 2016 to 2028. And as you can see here, I don't know if you're seeing my 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 arrow. Uh, there there is a, a, a significant uh, uh, contrast between the supply that you have here. Um, is the current utilization scenario. And, and then the supply, you know, there is a shortage. But the projected, uh, looking at the crystal ball, the projected uh, supply for the demand in, uh, in uh, uh, 2028 uh, is, uh, is a telling story, you know. So uh, uh, in a minute, I'm gonna share with you uh, the pipeline of psychiatrists to, to, to uh, uh, underscore that uh, something will need to be done in order to meet the demand for psychiatrists. This is for uh, uh, clinical psychologists, LMFTs, uh, and, and other uh, behavioral health professionals. And it's a similar uh, scenario as you can see on the slide. The demand uh, is going to uh, surpass uh, the supply. The supply is not as, as uh, low as it is with psychiatrists, but uh, you know many things can happen from now until uh, 2028. Uh, so this is the best uh, reading of the crystal ball at the present time. So uh, this is related to the pipeline uh, of psychiatrists. For example, these are the number of first year psychiatry residents in California. And as you can see, there has been an increase uh, in the last decade, you know, from 126 to, in 2021, 190. But the needs have increased as well, importantly, in terms of the demographic changes that uh, we, are, we have been experiencing. And this is just to give you a sense, this is the, the match rates for psychiatry re residency. Uh, and and uh, you can see, uh, uh, the positions that had been filled, the positions offered uh, in the match in California and the positions that had been filled. But one story that is important to keep in mind is that uh, 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 this percentage, uh, you know, in 2012 uh, of 70, basically 76% had been uh, filled by U.S. Uh, uh, me, 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 uh, uh, physician seniors. And uh, uh, which means that uh, we had been relying in, in California uh, from uh, 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 physicians who come and do residency training uh, uh, here in California coming from abroad or coming from 
uh, other, other countries. This is uh, how it looks like uh, for uh, the graduates uh, of educational programs for licensed behavioral health occupations. Uh, you can see there uh, uh, through the years, 2016 to 2020, there hasn't been too much of an increase. You know, it has been level. And in the case of uh, the master social work, actually it is in decline, you know, and uh, we'll see what happens, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what happens in the next few years. But I think that uh, COVID has uh, been a, a game changer, uh, definitely has been a, a game changer because uh, if there is time, I, I, I'll tell you uh, what is happening uh, since COVID that is going to reduce uh, the enrollment uh, potentially for, uh, for these professions. This is the graduates of behavioral health professionals, professions uh, by race and ethnicity. As you can see there, uh, there are significant disparities in proportion of the representations in the population. For example, the doctor, do, doctorate uh, students uh, in, uh, in, in psychology uh, are uh, way underrepresented uh, in relationship to the proportion in the population. And, 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 and you can see across uh, the various professions. Uh, but there are differences uh, by the specific uh, discipline that they, uh, uh, they, 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 they do. Uh, this is for the unlicensed behavioral health occupations. And there is a little bit more variability uh, but, uh, you know, the trend uh, since 2019 has been, at, uh, uh, you know, that the rates are lower than the previous, uh, uh, you know, years. Although there has been changes, as you can see, uh, in relationship to, to, to 2019 to 2020, uh, uh, the, the trend is uh, uh, towards lower rates. And I think uh, that in 2021 and 2022, uh, the rates uh, ha will be even lower uh, because of the impact that COVID has had on in the enrollment, especially in community colleges. Significant, significant uh, reduce uh, enroll en en enrollment in uh, uh, the during COVID. What are some of the strategies uh, for expanding health workforce capacity? Well. Uh, 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 this is a comprehensive, uh, 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 multi-pronged uh, 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 ways of uh, addressing the issues uh, for expanding the health workforce uh, capacity. One of them is uh, to enhance the education pipeline. And you can see some specific uh, mechanisms that can be used uh, to do uh, to do that and are being done actually in some uh, uh, some uh, 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 professions uh, and, and the educational uh, programs that uh, you know graduate uh, this uh, the various disciplines like expand the training recruit people likely to practice in underserved uh, populations this is of critical importance because of the uh, and even distribution of these professionals across the state, prepared to care for underserved populations. Uh, you know, uh, I, I gave this, uh, I gave a similar talk um, uh, a few months ago to legislators. You know, especially the the staff of the legislators through the uh, uh, Steinberg Institute, and they were very, very interested. They focused on loan repayment, for example which it deals with recruit and retain clinicians. Uh, the retention of clinicians is, is uh, very challenging. You know, we are working with some counties and, and there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, moving around of uh, MFTs and, 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 and other uh, disciplines. Uh, and, and they go where they get paid better or when they, where they have a, you know, incentives, better incentives. It is not uh, just related to, uh, to income, it's related to other things as well. So, and the recruit and retain clinicians, loan repayment, uh, other incentive programs, 
and support for their practices is of critical importance. Also, another uh, a, a, a strategy is uh, maximize uh, the existing workforce, you know, and there are several uh, issues related to that. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, payment reform to state uh, practice regulation uh, to delivery reform as well and to technology. Uh, uh, I just had a conversation uh, prior to this meeting with a group that uh, we had been meeting since March of 2020 uh, and uh, uh, we had been working with CalHOP. You know, this is a, a remarkable uh, initiative uh, uh, for uh, the state of California through the Department of Healthcare Services. And uh, we were talking about the importance of technology. Uh, and uh, uh, there are some of us who, uh, instead of uh, waiting for people to come uh, for services, you know, and uh, institutions like the one that, I, that I'm coming from, from UC Davis uh, uh, help, uh, uh, that we are now going to where the populations are, you know, and, and try to provide services in the point of need using digital health. Uh, so there are, there are differences now, and, and COVID uh, has really prompted us uh, to rethink the way in which we provide uh, services. And, and under leveraging data, you can see there that uh, it is of critical importance to, to have a finger on the pulse and to continue to collect data and, and to do some analysis and planning. Something that it would be great uh, for your board is that uh, whereas it is uh, relatively, uh, you know, data on psychiatrists uh, can be obtained. Uh, for other disciplines, it, it is difficult. The quantitative data is difficult to come, uh, to come by. So uh, uh, something for you to, to consider. So what are some of the conclusions? Well. Some regions of California have a small numbers uh, of behavioral health professionals uh, per capita relative to the state overall. Uh, many behavioral health professions, professionals are, are at or near retirement age. This is gonna ha have an impact and COVID has uh, prompted even more uh, plans for retirement. The behavioral, uh, behavioral workforce does not reflect the racial, ethnic, and linguistic diversity of the state's population, especially in professions that require a doctoral degree. Because of the lack of time, I didn't address the, the differences by language, you know, which are of critical importance as well, especially in the rural areas. Uh, number, uh, numbers of graduates of educational programs will not be sufficient to replace the retirees uh, or meet growing demand for the behavioral health services. And existing sources of data are not sufficient to fully assess California's recommendations health workforce needs. Um, uh, these are a few recommendations, uh, and then I have uh, other recommendations, uh, is to invest in behavioral health professions, education pipeline programs, which focus primarily on underrepresented and low-income persons um, especially at the college and post -back levels. Increased funding for psychiatric residency programs and psychiatric nurse practitioner education programs, which was one of the emphasis of the work that the commission did. Uh, provide funds for targeted increases in enrollment at community colleges and California medical and nursing school, especially with community colleges, once again, because just in one year from 2019 to 2020, there was a reduction in enrollment of 300,000 uh, uh, students that were expected to be enrolled, but they didn't. And there are reasons uh, related to that, of course. And then from 2020 uh, up until now, uh, the, the lack of enrollment has been even more. And there, are, there is a, an even distribution of who is not enrolling, uh, depending on where the students are, like in LA, you know, uh, uh, the Los Angeles Community College uh, saw a very pronounced, uh, uh, you know, relative low uh, enrollment. There are these uh, other two slides on the recommendations that are specific to behavioral health that come from the California Future Health Workforce Commission. I won't read them. I would uh, strongly recommend that you do it uh, at your leisure. 
that are absolutely worth uh, looking at. This is very thoughtful uh, recommendations coming from many, many people and organizations, as I mentioned at the beginning, that uh, came together uh, to give their, uh, their best uh, thinking in terms of how to remedy these, these uh, challenges. This is, uh, other, these are other recommendations, once again, pertinent to the behavioral health uh, workforce. And I won't read it again, and, but uh, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at them at your leisure. And with that, uh, I'm gonna uh, finish here and we'll be more than happy to answer questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aguilar uh, Gahiola. Uh, how do you say the last oh, name? Oh, you said it. You said it perfectly. Okay. Per perfectly. Gahiola is is great. Thank you. Um, really appreciate your presentation. I think it it really helped um, set a, a basis for discussion about uh, some of the core issues for this committee. So I really appreciate that. And um, you know, several of your comments have been reflected of the conversation we've had so far as a board, um, but particularly uh, geographic distribution, um, you know, a pending retirement crisis, and certainly the diversity of the workforce are, are big priorities at the board. So um, with that, I think um, I will check with my fellow board members to see if they have any questions for you. Let's see if I can get everybody on my screen here. Um, do you have any Questions from board members? Uh, Dr. Walker. Yes, thank you for that. Just really informative and um, it was a very in-depth presentation, Dr. Aguilar. Um, I just wanted to, are you, will you be sticking around throughout our meeting here? Yes, I'm, I'm planning to be here until 10. Okay, uh, because yes. I may circle back. I'm processing what you said. And um, so I don't have a question at this time, but just wanted to thank you for that uh, just really great presentation. I really do think that it has, it will jumpstart our conversation and it is a great foundation to, to move from. My pleasure. Thank you for thank your you. kind comment. Great. And um, board member Friedman. We can't hear you. Board so member you Friedman, you may need to unmute your microphone. I sent you a request. Sorry. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your being here and sharing all of these ideas, which of course are ideas that we have all been thinking about ourselves in a way. And so I'm curious about two things. One, is there any particular money in the new budget that the governor is proposing? And when we had all this money, we had tons and tons of money, and then suddenly the, now we are in a deficit somehow or other. But I'm wondering if there is money in there because we need to have money to attract these people who are of different ethnicities, different languages. We need to go to the schools, talk to these people, and we need to have the right people talking to them. We can't just have anyone going. We need to have the right people talking and explaining the need and explaining somebody available to talk to them if they're interested. And the fact that there's money available for them to go to school. If we don't supply the money, they're not gonna go because they don't have the money. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, resources are needed in order to deal with this uh, uh, you know, currently uh, uh, significant shortages and things are going to get worse, you know, given the forecasting that is, uh, has been done. Uh, and the answer is, uh, yes, there is some money, not enough. Uh, you know, there, uh, there has been a significant investment in, in mental health related or behavioral health related uh, issues in California. For example, uh, I have been involved in some aspects of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, and there is uh, there are resources for for uh, education related to that, and there are others uh, other uh, 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 you know funding streams that are uh, also, for example, uh, 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 there has been funding for uh, nurse uh, 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 psychiatric nurse, nurse practitioners, for example. There has been a lot of a lot of emphasis on that. And there are foundations 
here in, uh, in California, like the California Healthcare Foundation, that are providing resources, along with others, it's not the only foundation, uh, to really beef up uh, the, the uh, psychiatric uh, nurse practitioners, because it's one of the, uh, one of the uh, gaps that was uh, identified by the California Future uh, uh, Workforce, uh, Health Workforce Commission. Uh, one thing that I would suggest, uh, 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 board member uh, uh, Friedman, is uh, that you go to the, you haven't, if you haven't seen the report of the commission, I would strongly recommend that you do, because there are 27 recommendations, and some of them are related to behavioral health. And each of those recommendations have a specific uh, uh, proposal, you know, for funding. And, and what is needed is advocacy, is to advocate for the state of California and to other, uh, uh, you know, agencies uh, to uh, put, uh, you know, to, 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 to get funding. So I, I would strongly recommend that you take a look at it because uh, there is a lot of work that, uh, that has been done and it is just, uh, you know, uh, requires uh, advocacy. Uh, but I cannot agree more. More funding is needed. I'm, I'm curious if you have a list of those or if it, it's in the report, a list of those organizations that you mentioned that would be able to be at, at least going out there and advocating. It, it should be in the, in the report. Okay, if not, uh, someone from your board can, uh, 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 um, you know, contact me. And uh, when I was co-chairing the Behavioral Health Subcommittee, we have a list uh, of who participated and, and many uh, advocacy uh, organizations. Uh, so uh, I'll be more than happy to share that with you. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. And just as a note, the report is actually in the next memo. There's a link to it, but I could definitely supply you uh, with the actual report. So I'll do that. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say something. Oh. Just, to pre just to preface my, my um, noticing that my internet connection is not the best. So, But um, I just wanted to thank you, Doctor, for that presentation. It's kind of what I had, had thought it would be. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. sorry, you guys kind of disappear. Um, yeah, so I'm in the Central Valley, and um, we we do have a, a big challenge. We have a very diverse community here with, I'd say, probably 80, 90 plus different languages. So, um, yeah, I can see that in the importance of getting some more diversity, and then also we, we run into the challenge of translation like currently I'm working in, um, um, like in a jail and it's, you know, people, you know, just having translation services and then, you know, diversity issues, you know, so that's so important. And then also, I, I don't know if they talked about like mentoring, you know, um, in there, but um, I, I think, and then I, I noticed in there, there was, the different populations and I, I saw at one point the Native Americans and that just kind of dropped off because I know just in higher education itself it's just so low <laughs> but um yeah I would like to see how the points connect you know given your report and how it kind of comes down as far as ways that we can better advocate yeah no thank you so much for uh those comments and and all of them resonate with me uh board member Uribe and, uh, and I'm so glad that you are representing the Central Valley. I have a soft spot for the Central Valley. I spent uh, 15 years of uh, my, my family and my life uh, in Fresno. I, oh, I was a professor, okay. at, I was a professor at, at Fresno State oh. uh, for 15 years. And then I was recruited to come to UC Davis. Uh, uh, but I was at uh, UC, uh, at uh, Fresno State, uh, uh, up until 2005, and and I I did uh, you know population based studies while I was there uh, with people of uh, let's say uh, for example uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Mexican origin in, in Fresno County. It's a, it was a countywide study. And I'm very aware of the incredible needs that we have in the Valley. Uh, I, and the incredible disparities also in so many different levels. And I, so I'm delighted that you are from, from, the, from the Valley and, uh, 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 you know, and that you are uh, a part of the board uh, because uh, usually uh, it, it is not com common that uh, in boards that, that I either belong to or, or that I, I, I'm aware that there is representation precisely from the Valley. So bravo to the board <laughs> and to you for participating. And I'll Thank be you. happy to be in, in touch with you, uh, uh, Board uh, uh, Uribe, uh, if, uh, if there is any information that we can exchange as well. That would be wonderful. And I'm, I'm also at Fresno State too, so ah, <laughs> I missed <my> you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question, then we'll go to uh, Dr. Walker, Dr. Walker, who also has her hand up. Sure. Um, I, both Dr. Walker and I are, are in the Inland Empire region, and uh, it's one of the other regions with, with a pretty significant yes. uh, workforce shortage. Um, so what sort of incentives have you seen that might be effective in kind of encouraging a little more, you know, even geographical distribution or, you know, how can we help um, make sure that there's enough uh, people within each region to serve the residents there? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate your raising that. Uh, we have been working with different counties. Uh, for example, our center work uh, with Solano County for about five years because the county behavioral health division came uh, uh, to me and to us at our center uh, to help uh, for something that was community initiated. And that was the significant underutilization of services by uh, specific populations. And they came back with the data. They show us that uh, Latinos, for example, and Filipinos uh, and LGBTQ populations were way underserved uh, in Solano County. So we, we work with them, you know, for uh, uh, seven years, basically, but we got funding for five and a half years to transform uh, uh, mental health service delivery uh, or behavioral health uh, service delivery uh, at the county. And one of the things that they did, you know, in uh, quality improvement plans that they developed based on the intervention that we came up with was incentivize, you know, uh, bilingual, for example, bilingual providers, which are in short supply as well, uh, uh, incentivize and incentivize with uh, higher compensation, for example, incentivize them, uh, those who are uh, a, a deployed to the rural areas as well, in which the needs are, are tremendous. But, uh, you know, one of the biggest incentives that we have seen is that there is a culture uh, within the organizations that uh, value them, that uh, really uh, is related to provider satisfaction. You know? So if it is possible to increase the provider satisfaction, you know, through different kinds of incentives uh, from, you know, recognition of their work, awards, uh, compensation, uh, you know, hours, uh, et cetera. That, that uh, really seemed to be, uh, to be making a difference in terms of retention and in terms of uh, recruitment uh, as well. You know, uh, uh, so I, those are things that uh, we have seen already. This is not theoretical. We have seen this on the ground of uh, what kind of incentives uh, can make a difference. Thank you, and we'll go to Dr. Walker next. Yeah, I'll try to be brief. I'm just really uh, captivated by this conversation, and but I can't help but to put our conversation um, in the moment. 
I know we're looking at addressing gaps, but when we're looking at protecting uh, the population and communities that we serve, they're hurting right now. So there is a need that we need to address like today. And so I wonder in your um, research here and, and with the commission, did we look at maybe some of those aspects, like for example, addressing um, the bilingual uh, need to for translation of, of communication and you know things like that, mm -hmm. written and verbal, but also did cultural competency come up? I mean, you know, we have to address those needs right now. And I just wondered, did, did that come up? Because there are things that we can do right now with curriculum and then, you know, enrollment and educational training, um, best practices, what came up? Yeah, thank you for that uh, really good question. And, 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 and you are absolutely right. The need is now and our, our, our uh, communities are hurting, mm -hmm. you know, especially after going through these most remarkable years of COVID. You know, the mental health crisis is all over, and, and uh, especially in children and youth, you know, but across all the age groups as well. And it happens at the, you know, uh, rural air, uh, in the rural areas, the urban areas, the suburban areas, it, it just uh, is pervasive. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things that we did in Solano County was to use the culturally and linguistically appropriate services standards uh, as the framework uh, to, to train uh, three cohorts of uh, behavioral health providers uh, and, and community members as well. You know, actually we purposefully included in the trainees, uh, included, uh, you know, representatives from different sectors. It wasn't not only the behavioral health division of the county and the community partners that they are working with, that they have uh, also providers, but also representatives from school, churches, law enforcement, transportation, uh, which is, uh, are the services that people who are unable to receive services that they go to, social services, for example. So it is important to work with all of these uh, sectors. Um, and right now, uh, uh, I'm very, very pleased actually to share with uh, all of you that uh, the intervention and the evidence that we created of working with Solano County uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, you know, uh, a scaled up uh, through a what we call a learning collaborative of training uh, uh, representatives of about 40 counties, counties that they have said, we want to learn about, uh, you know, uh, the class standards, uh, you know, the development of the quality improvement plans or action plans. And, uh, and if you invite me in the future, I'll be happy to share with you uh, more about that. And uh, I just gave a talk uh, two days ago, no, on Tuesday, uh, to representatives of 40 counties, once again, uh, uh, on this very topic that you're talking about, you know, and uh, uh, I'm very proud of that effort. Uh, it, it was not only us, you know, it was a collective effort, uh, starting with the county behavioral health division uh, and community partners and a lot of community leaders and along with us as well, you know, but we collectively responded to the question as to whether it is possible to advance mental health equity in with historically underserved populations using community-based approaches. But uh, we used uh, the class standards as the main framework uh, for the interventions that, uh, that uh, were made and continue to be made, by the way. No, I appreciate that. And just while I'm thinking about it, I think, Steve, if you're listening to me, I think this may be uh, maybe something that this board may recommend that staff follow up with. And I'm just throwing this out there. I'm not saying that this is what we need to do, but just building on what, um, what we just heard, um, maybe this is where the board could be uh, proactive and start to advocate for if we, because we know how long it takes to create policy and move things along that way. But if we could start to advocate and build some momentum here 
and looking at the strategies that were just mentioned, then maybe we could push the move or start the movement to, to use some of those uh, community-based approaches and practices to further the culturally um, competent training to others, because that's something that can help the need of, of those that need it the most right now. If we can use what we have, we know what we're lacking, but if we, we have to use the workforce that we have the best way that we possibly can. And to give them incentives, not to add more to their plate, but to give them incentives to take on this cultural competency piece so that they can open their doors and extend their reach to more people in these, uh, to fill the gaps, if you will, at least with some increased services. But we need, we need to get that cultural competency piece in there mm -hmm. um, because it's, you know, and this way we're servicing and we're helping the, the professionals to help them be better trained to service the people that walk through their door so that they have the tools and competency that they need and not feel like they have to turn uh, uh, people away. Be you know what I'm saying? Because they really don't have the tools to uh, the trades to really service them as best as possible. So we I don't want that for these yeah, people. I I, yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no problem. Oh. But I, I cannot agree more with you. You know, uh, a, a board member Uribe, who lives in the Central Valley, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I'm sure that uh, we both share the, the views that there are this high proportion of people who are monolingual, let's say mo, uh, monolingual Spanish speakers, and who speak other languages, you know, indigenous languages like Mixteco or uh, you know, there, there, are, there is some uh, uh, Hmong, Punjabi uh, in, 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 in the county that are uh, almost totally, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with lack of services. Uh, and, uh, and with the workforce that we have, as we saw the differences by race and ethnicity uh, in, in, in the existing workforce, uh, one of the things that we ought to do is to is to provide uh, you know trainings in cultural linguistic competence. Yeah. Uh, so that workforce, because it's comprised primarily of white uh, folks, uh, you know, is to sensitize them and and to equip them with yes. skills that they will uh, really provide uh, more effective services for those in need. Yeah, and we need to partner with other agencies. I'm sure you're familiar with social marketing. There is, there are means and ways to get this information out to communities that you know where language is a, is is an impact. Um, so yeah, so we could talk about this forever, but I would hope that this uh, committee would take away some of the the thoughts and ideas that you just shared, and that I think we can move on this, you know, in 2023 with the BBS to advance some of these strategies that you're mentioning. Yes, yeah. I, I want to thank you again for this opportunity to share with you and for your excellent questions and comments. And, and uh, I'm sorry that I have to leave. Uh, I have another meeting right now, but uh, 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 we'd love to keep in touch. And if I can be of any help in the future, please let me know. Thank you so much you for being here. I think we all appreciate um, your your contributions and conversation this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we need to uh, take any uh, public comment on this one? Uh -huh. Yeah, you can ask if there's any questions. Unfortunately, we don't have the expertise here. Um, but you. if anybody has any questions, please do. Moderator, are there any uh, questions? Well, I did want to point out that uh, board committee member Susan Friedman has her hand up. I don't know if that's fresh or remaining from last time. Oh, I can't. I'm sorry, um, board member Friedman. I could not see you on my screen. All right. Is that hand still up from last time? I'll just say this very, very quickly. Um, I recently had to answer all of my questions for the Senate Rules Committee, and I was talking with Steve, and I and I, I, we are limited in the kind of demographic information that we're allowed to collect. I mean, 
can't collect those things. So I said to Steve, why can't we put something on our website where we ask our licensees to voluntarily list their language ability and list their specialty so that, for example, there may be some white people who speak Spanish and there may be some people who are African-American who are, people say, I want an African-American therapist. I don't want a white therapist. And this would be a way for people to find the kind of person that they are looking for. I mean, this is just one little thing that we could possibly do. Thank you. I, I think we'll uh, probably take that into the next conversation. Um, but let's uh, go back for make, make sure we uh, pick up any public comments that may be out there. Certainly, this is the moderator and I've opened up the Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If anyone would like to comment, they can look for the question mark icon in the lower right corner of their WebEx screen or behind the three dot other options. If you are on a mobile device, type the word comment into the text box and click send, or you may raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon. And again, if you're on a mobile device, that's behind the three dot other options or our call-in users can press star three to raise their hand. And we do have some requests for public comment. Uh, one of them is, the first is from uh, someone logged into WebEx under the name Ben Caldwell. Ben, I'm gonna send you a request to unmute your microphone and you will have two minutes to speak with a 15 second warning. You're unmuted. Thank you, good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. So <clears throat> I, I know that Dr. Aguilar Gacciola has left, but I really want to thank the uh, committee for putting this on the agenda for having that presentation today. It was fascinating. Um, I appreciate Dr. Walker's concern for some immediate solutions. And this is going back a bit to the discussion in the last full board meeting, but um, I, I just want to call back to the discussion there about the uh, clinical exams for licensure and particularly the ASWB clinical exam. If we're wanting a workforce that is uh, more diverse, more representative of the actual population of California, you know, one of the ways we can get there is by having a licensed workforce that more closely aligns with actually the career pipeline. And we know that one of the things that's happening now is that the clinical exams for licensure, not just for social work, but for all the, the board governed professions, those clinical exams stop a lot of people at the clinical exam stage. Um, as a reminder, the pass rate for first time examinees who are white on the ASWB clinical exam is about twice that of the pass rate for first time examinees who are black. So one of the most immediate and impactful ways that the board could help create a more diverse and representative workforce is to change what we do about clinical exams. Thank you. And our next request for comment comes from someone logged into WebEx as Melanie Cottrell. Melanie, I'm gonna send you a request to unmute your microphone and you'll have two minutes to speak and you are unmuted. Good morning, Melanie Cottrell, Executive Director, California Association of School Psychologists. I greatly appreciate the presentation this morning. It's unsurprising and a little disheartening to see the numbers. One thing I noted about the presentation is that licensed educational psychologists were not listed anywhere. I'm unsure if the doctor had them lumped in with psychologists or not, but I just wanted to note that particularly because the board obviously regulates LAPs, but LAPs take a little bit of an unusual path to their license and that they first actually have to seek a PPS credential which is a slightly different degree and a slightly different process. And then after they've held their credential for a couple of years, they go on to get their license. As a result of that unusual process, LEPs are very often left out or not qualified for workforce development programs because they're working in a school, not a traditional healthcare setting. So I just wanted to note that and ask that as these efforts move forward, please keep that in mind and consider ways to include LEPs in those efforts. Thank you. And our next request for comment comes from someone logged into WebEx as Kimberly Miller. K 
Kimberly, I'll send you a request to unmute your microphone and you'll have two minutes to speak. And you're unmuted. Uh, my name is Kimberly Miller and I have been attending the meetings. I'm an, I am a candidate to try to pass the exam and I'm getting ready to be on the sixth time. And uh, the current process has actually uh, removed me from you know the the limit to uh, work in a profession. I was working at the LA County Jail, and it was either resign or be demoted or uh, let go. Um, and that is one of the barriers as well is that um, we can lose our jobs over what Ben Caldwell was saying, and that is one of the big barriers as well as. The cost of education, uh, the pay, um, and also the big one that I have is the treatment of workers in the institutions and agencies by supervisors um, and the hierarchy. Um, there's a lot of, I would almost line it up with abuse. Um, I've seen it, I've witnessed it, and they don't value the people at the ground level. And they don't want to listen to what we have to say and they make policies without really listening to what is going on at the ground level. And adding into Annette Walker, um, you know, sh there's some stuff that needs to be done right now, especially with ethnicities who are incarcerated, you know, and a lot of people are quitting that area and there needs to be more emphasis right now on co-occurring co uh, substance use and 15 seconds mental health and specifically uh, training in forensic social work, which I was lucky to get a dual master's in uh, social work and criminal justice at Loma Linda. And, and I. And our next request for comment is from a call in user from the 916 area code. Uh, if you would to, were to press star six, you can unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes. Hello, this is Rebecca Gonzalez with the National Association of Social Workers California chapter. Sorry, I had a hard time going in uh, having the volume on the WebEx this morning. Um, I also want to thank the board for having this presentation. Um, and I also was happy to see that the social work profession was was a bit more diverse than some of the others. Um, I was also going to bring up such as as, um, as Ben did and I believe Kimberly about the exam and that really is something we need to look at because of the disparities there and look at alternative paths to licensure. Um, I also wanted to address, I think it was Susan's question about the workforce um, money in the budget and what's happening this year is that the governor actually is delaying some of the workforce spending that was passed last year. Last year the legislature paid uh, very close attention to workforce proposals but the governor is delaying not eliminating but just spreading out the spending and we're not going to get as much as we thought we were initially. Um, and also just so the board knows, I am continuing to advocate to get that funding now and the other professional associations that usually call in are also active in that space. Um, lastly, just as a way to reach more students of color and, and this is probably obvious and it probably happens more now than it did. Um, but when I was in high school, for example, um, I, you know, neither of my parents graduated from college. So I didn't have a very good idea of what professions are out there. And so I think it's just really important that we get clinicians of color that go and speak to high schools and are that role model for students and even letting them know seconds. that there are opportunities out there. Thank you. And I see no further requests for public comment. Shall I close Shall that I feature? Shall I close public comment? Yes, sorry. That's okay. And Wendy, can I just make a, a, a quick comment? Sure. Yeah, just before we move on, because we're going to be talking about workforce and what the board can do. Um, and Dr. 
um, Aguiar Gaxiola uh, had really talked about a lot of some of the good um, programs and such that are going out there in that when we got in the conversation about the cultural competency and the programs that um, the community-based organizations are doing. Um, it's, it's fantastic. There's a lot of work being done out there already. Um, what we're going to be venturing into next is really talking about our place and how we can really help out. Um, a lot of what we can do is outreach, not really advocacy per se. Um, I hopefully can better define that, but um, there's a lot of the stakeholder associations that really can um, do the advocacy part towards these programs and, and, and encouraging the funding, working with other government and government agencies to make them know that we, you know, that there, there should be extra money going to these organizations. It's not necessarily in the boards, in my opinion, and I hope I'm not um, outstepping my boundaries, but it's not necessarily within our purview. What I really see is more of outreach to those actually clinicians because the licensing population is really in our wheelhouse and our responsibility. So it's tricky to figure out what we can do and what we're going to move on and what we can do to support this. Um, it'll take a lot of uh, discussions and, and, and kind of strategizing, but just wanted to kind of balance that out there to make sure that we're, as a board, advocacy is is not, not a really a big action for us, or it's not necessarily in our, in our, um, in our purview, I would say. More outreach though, we can do outreach. I hope that that's is, okay. Uh, this is Sabina, if I could chime in. Thank you, Steve. Yes, I was going to say something similar, but I think we have a really great group of stakeholders and associations to um, take on those challenges. And if you ever, you know, any of our meetings, if you ever have a question about whether or not this is something the board can uh, help out in or should be concerned with, um, always just go back to our mission and vision statements and even that statement that Wendy read in the beginning of each, uh, of the beginning of the meeting or where the um, chair always reads a big um, statement in the beginning of the meeting about what the board is concerned with um, or, or look at our strategic plan with our mission and vision statements um, to kind of remind ourselves where the board falls within these roles and these different interests. Thank you, Steve and Sabina, for always reminding us uh, um, of our, our primary responsibility and its protection of the public. Um, I, you know, I would, I do agree. And, uh, you know, part of protection of the public is also, you know, access to care and, and diversity of care. So I think uh, the board, as you know, has a significant interest in um, doing what we can within our purview. Um, and I think that is, the primary topic of item eight, um, but I imagine that that may be a robust discussion. So maybe we should take a 10 minute break before we proceed to that item. Is that, does anybody have any objections to that? Okay, um, so it's 1014, um, maybe we'll come back at 1025. Okay, thank you, we'll be back at 1025. Okay, do we have our um, all of our board members back from the break? Board member Uribe and uh, board member Friedman. I'm here. Okay, great. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, are back from the break and ready to proceed with agenda item eight, um, which is discussion and possible recommendation regarding workforce development action plan. And uh, Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So as you saw in that presentation, there's a lot of work ahead of us and there's a lot of stuff to be done, not just by us, but a lot of other organizations. But um, I know that um, all the board members, you know, I know you've expressed very, uh, you're very eager to begin the process. So this is what we're trying to do here is there's a lot of um, possibilities where we can help to, uh, you know, affect the workforce and increase the workforce. And um, my goal of what we're 
my goal in this presentation is just to kind of give you an idea of what I'm thinking we can kind of focus on. And then from here, after this, after our discussion here, the plan is to really come down with a strategic plan in essence um, to what we can do in this licensing committee and in the board to actually, you know, be proactive and help out with this workforce shortage and ensuring that uh, Californians do have access to care because as I said in my report, you know, public protection is our main mandate for the board. But in my view, I consider that access to care is also a, a public uh, protection issue too, because if you don't have the care or access to care, culturally competent care too, that um, we're gonna have Californians that are in jeopardy and in um, not meet, in getting the necessary mental health services they need, which is not good. Um, the report that doc, the doctor was actually mentioning, I did put a link to it in our in the memo. Um, I could provide a copy of that also to the board members afterwards. And it's um, like he said, there is a whole bunch of different uh, strategic plans that they've already laid out. And he in the one slide he was showing there was four real kind of components to the action steps, and that's um, was enhancing the educational pipeline the recruitment and retention of licensees, leveraging data, and maximizing the workforce. What been mel, mel, mulling over this to figure out, you know, how do we, how should we as a board kind of focus our attention? And really it does kind of relate to those four steps except for maximizing the workforce. And what I was wanting us to focus on is looking at, first of all, looking at the data because that's where we really have to find out, um, you know, where are the issues, where are the gaps, and, um, you know, it will, that's the only way we can actually utilize our resources, I think, efficiently to, to help out in, this, in the workforce shortage. The next step is looking at reducing barriers, and um, really, I, that kind of ties in, we'll have to see what the uh, the actual different strategic action items they have in the report, but it does kind of go in with the pipeline, um, the licensing pipeline. We really want to make sure that we're not, do have, there's not any undue burdensome um, barriers in the way of people becoming licensed. And then lastly, we're, I want us to focus on the recruitment and retention. Um, like he said in this, like was presented in the slides, we are having, we're probably coming up with a lot of retirees pretty soon. Um, and we need to make sure that not only for retirees, but also clinicians that are out there that are giving overworked and deciding not to proceed on with becoming licensed. Um, we need to make sure that we can do all we can to encourage them to either stay in the profession or, um, you know, work as a supervisor. So, those are kind of the three focus, data analysis, reducing barriers, and record retention. Now, the idea is there's a lot of ideas that we have, I have, we've been floating around talking about it uh, during in-house here. Um, and I've kind of laid out some of the ideas that we currently have, um, so or some of the action items. We are some working on some of these already. So the data analysis, what we really are going to do is partner with the healthcare access and information um, group to get better data. And currently right now, they are actually collecting the data from our licensees on the renewal process. And this is actually, it's I'm really excited to be able to eventually dive into this. Um, the data was started to collect last, this, last July. So um, it's starting to come in and this will get us a better idea of how uh, the basically the demographics of our licensees and also utilizations of where our licensees are working, um, what county, what type of agencies. So that's going to be really helpful for us to move forward. Um, additionally, I want to look at our data, um, just the licensing data. It's pretty pretty basic, but kind of identifying where the dropout rates are. I, I don't know if that's the proper term. I'm I'm claiming a dropout rates, but want to take a look at how somebody, where we see people really just stopping the licensure process. Is it, you know, when they initially get the registration, how many 
registrants are not deciding to carry on towards licensure? Or, you know, are we having issues with the, the clinical exam? How many people forget, um, don't, don't continue on to licensure because of the exam? Um, there's various other data points I want to look at, but I think we need to take a, a real deep look, deeper look at that so we can kind of identify some of the, um, just the basic, you know, basic processing and license pathway barriers and, and looking for ways to, um, you know, assist in that. Uh, additionally, you know, it was brought up, we, we had the ASWB exam, the clinical exam that came out with the demographic data. Um, in our meeting, in the board meeting last um, November. Um, we are currently going, we're working with the Office of Professional Examination Services to begin collecting data on our own exams. Um, we'll be looking at the possibility of doing that and that will be presented. It should be, could be the board meeting, um, but that's gonna be necessary. It's gonna be critical data for us to see. Um, once again, on that, on data, we have to understand is it's, can be interpreted so many different ways. So once we get this data, it's going to be it's going to take um, some really good conversations to figure out, you know, what what the issues really are. So so that's with data collection, um, reducing barriers. Um, once again, real basic. Wanted to look internally at our paper process and our ap application process. What's causing people to have, you know, issues in getting through to licensure. Um, we want to look even deeper, and I'm not sure how to do this yet, but we'll be looking at it. Um, looking at reasons why uh, people aren't able to meet the educational requirements uh, for licensure. And um, additionally, trying to look at my notes here, sorry. <laughs> additionally, also, um, Thinking of ways that we can reduce those barriers, and some of the things I've uh, we mentioned in the report is um, considering um, looking at the fees that we charge. Maybe uh, some financial burden is the financial burden may keep people out of uh, moving on towards licensure or staying in the profession. Um, doing looking for uh, ways to uh, you know ease the burden of supervisors um, if they are maybe just in it to supervise, maybe we can look at, um, you know, easing this, the continuing education credits for them. So it kind of encourages them to stay as a supervisor and help out with the kind of pipeline, the licensure pipeline. Um, additionally, looking at the reducing barriers, one of the big items would be to actually really review our licensure requirements and see if, um, if there's anything that um, we really identify as something that's keeping people out of the profession. Um, with the key caveat, if we wanna make any decisions, we have to really keep that uh, thought of public protection in there and making sure that, I guess in all with the, with the barriers to license, we wanna make sure that it's you know, an equitable process, um, but that maintains public protection. It's kind of the overall arching idea for um, looking at reducing barriers. On the third one, recruitment and, and recruitment and retention. Um, this is where it comes in where there's a lot of advocacy for uh, stakeholder groups and other agencies that really um, kind of are operate in that recruitment and retention because we really as a as a licensing board, like I said, it's our, our role is not necessarily advocacy, but the way I'm looking at it, though, is we can produce outreach materials and to assist those, maybe those agencies could use our materials themselves into kind of encouraging people into coming into the licensed mental health professional, become not licensed, but becoming, becoming a mental health professional. Um, so that's one of the th ways we can actually assist in that, really producing outreach materials, performing outreach to, um, currently, right now, you know, we do outreach to college uh, master levels, uh, people that are about to graduate, but we've never really done any, um, you know, outreach to people in a bachelor's degree or even high school. Um, unfortunately, that does require resources, so that is very restrictive for us, but 
I think what we need to do is look, keep looking, you know, for opportunities like that and kind of weigh it out of what we actually can do. But I think outreach is going to be very important to help with this, uh, with the workforce shortage. Additionally, you know, we can always, we're definitely going to support all the activities that HCI is doing. Um, like was mentioned before, the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative and the loans and scholarship and grants. Um, making sure that, you know, registrants and um, graduates understand that there's money out there to help them through the process. And um, and just making sure people are aware, our, licensings, our licensees are aware and the public's aware of, of what's going on with trying to increase this workforce. So there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, there's a lot of possibility, a lot of work to be done. And... Um, I'm still learning. I'm, I've been been trying to get more active or have been more active in uh, attending some of these additional meetings like HKI is having the meetings and learning more about what is going on out there, doing my reading. So I think um, it is definitely something um, we need to be a part of in, in, in doing all we can to help out with the workforce development. Um, that being said, we really um, need to take time to think strategically of how we can actually affect that. So um, these are just some of the ideas. I hope, I hope you've read through the memo, some of the ideas that we're thinking about. Um, and kind of focus is what I'm looking, the different focus uh, focuses that I'm looking at. Um, additionally, I think for the next meeting too, I'm going to take a closer look at what the, I have read very quickly what the, the report that came out that the doctor was talking about um, and try to translate what they thought were some of the strategic plans, try to translate that into how we can use, uh, how as a board, a regulatory board, we can actually uh, work towards those. So um, apologize for rambling all over the place. Uh, this is a lot of stuff to talk about. So I think um, I'd like to open it up to see if anybody has any like comments or suggestions. And with the thought that what the next step is, is the next licensing committee meeting, uh, we can, we'll bring forward kind of a strategic plan on short-term goals, medium goal, uh, short-term and then long-term goals to kind of show you what we, what we think we can do, um, you know, moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um... We'll start with board member Friedman. Thanks, Steve. Walker. Thanks, Steve. Um, the first thing I want to say is you reminded me a lot recently that our job is not recruitment. So if our job is not recruitment, either one, we need to get our job definition changed and maybe that requires legislation if they really think it's important that we deal with recruitment because getting people who are retired or getting new people, all of that, that's recruitment. And if that's not our job, then we have to figure out how to do it. What I was gonna say is one thing that we could do, you know, I feel very strongly about this, that when you send someone who really captures the attention of the students, they pay attention. So if you send someone like Michael Phelps, who really had a big mental health problem, or maybe still has, I don't know, to talk to them about the need for getting more people into this profession. You're gonna get more kids paying attention, I would think, than not. And there are a lot of people like that that we can rely on, a lot. Many, many more than you would imagine. And I think that's one thing that we could do if we can't ourselves personally go out and recruiting. Um, and the second thing I want to say is what I said before, and I think this is legal, Sabina, I think it's legal. If we ask our licensees to put on our website their language, if they voluntarily, if their language ability and their particular specialty, whether ha having to do with their ethnicity, probably. And I don't think that that's against kind of law that we have to follow, uh, is it? And if it isn't, then why don't we, why don't we recommend that 
to the board that we institute that immediately. Uh, uh, this is Sabina. I think the board already does some type of voluntary survey in regards to demographic data. The problem, there's a lot of issues with demographic data that's voluntary, as I know that we've already discussed and people have presented about. And um, so that's, there's already some kind of hurdles there because we cannot mandate it. We also cannot mandate when somebody fills out something voluntarily, if they're actually providing the truth, that's also another kind of uh, glitch in um, asking people to voluntarily um, submit information. But I think we already have something to sort of to that effect as a survey, as a voluntary, if I remember correctly. Um, but um, again, um, we still have to remain within our purview of you know, consumer protection and um, that kind of stuff when we're talking about our workforce development plan. We just um, need to keep that in mind. Boy, if we have the information, that's one thing. But, sorry, if we have the information, that's one thing. What I'm suggesting is that we ask our licensees if they want to volunteer a language that they speak and or a specialty that they have, having to deal with ethnicity probably, but anything else, and that they could put that on our website because having the information is one thing, but not putting it on the website is, would be useless. But this way, if somebody's looking for a, a therapist, they can find someone who speaks another language and they can find somebody who may be African-American or any, any other thing that they're looking for. Oh, I understand what you're trying to say now. Yeah, that um, characteristics like that are protected classes, and I'm not sure um, legally if we can just um, be putting that kind of information out there. That is, again, um, I'm sure um, they would probably people might already have their own websites that might have pictures of them or information about them personally that can help someone choose a therapist um, that would be more appropriate for them or who they may feel comfortable with. Um, and again, our job is to make sure that our therapists and practitioners are safe to practice and that uh, are protecting our consumers as best to our ability. Maybe that's something an association might be interested in making some kind of directory. Okay. And, and, and Susan, we can take on, I, I can definitely look more into that and talk with legal and maybe the stakeholders too, to see what the value. Um, once uh, the other thing I uh, kind of to mention too with our website, uh, unfortunately, I think our audience really is and it should be focused on primarily um, licensees because that's what we're here for. That's our job. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's there. I'm, I'm always willing to look at stuff like that because you, I mean, I definitely for somebody to be able to find a, a correct therapist or somebody, a therapist that would work well with them, that's good. Um, so I, we can definitely, I'll, I'll take that back. We'll look at it some more. Yeah, I would. Uh, it does, I mean, if they're licensed, we've already decided that they are appropriate to practice and, and that they can protect the public. So there's would be nothing wrong in asking them if you speak another language and you'd like to let people know that you could put it on our website. You could list it on our website so the people looking for someone speaking another language can find you. If you're a particular ethnicity and that's part of how you practice, if and you want to put it on our website, I don't understand anything that would be wrong by it's asking it voluntarily. We've already licensed this person, so they should be safe. Okay, thank you, uh, board member Reven, uh, Dr. Walker. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, just really quickly, uh, before I make my comments, I wanted to uh, let Susan know that I hear you clearly. And I'm hoping that um, given what Steve said, that we were going to dig a little bit deeper in the board's data uh, to see what we have there and know what we're working with. So my thought is once we know more, we might be able to do more based on what legal um, helps us or assists us with and keeping and staying within our boundaries. But I'm hoping that Steve will bring that information forward really soon, uh, Susan, because I am a Spanish-speaking African-American educator. And the first day I walked in uh, as a substitute teacher, as I was working on my credentialing, 
I was in a newcomer's class and the African-American uh, principal at, looked at me and asked me, well, I don't know if it was a comment or if, I don't remember if it was a question. She's like, well, I hope you speak Spanish. And I'm like, well, as a matter of fact, I do. But if no one had asked me and I didn't really know what I was stepping into, um, the information may not have gone out there and therein uh, lies my bilingual classroom elementary experience as a teacher, which I didn't go in thinking that I would use that, but it was uh, meant to be, right? So, you, 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 so I hear you clearly, and hopefully we'll be able to circle back and, and uh, get more information based on the questions that you asked today, okay? So I just wanted to say that. And um, for my comments, Steve, thank you for uh, your comments. Um, and so I just wanted to circle back on what I brought forth earlier with culturally competent training, if you will, based on our presenters' uh, information. So, and coupled with the public comments, I'm hoping that you'll bring back and work with staff and bring back some of the things that we can do right here, right now, based on partnering and using community-based approaches for intervention and uh, this could, I can imagine that we can take some of this stuff into the schools where, uh, again, me not being clear on, on where our boundaries are at this point, um, where we might be able to share our thoughts on what that curriculum looks like, community-based curriculum, and what understanding what they're getting right now so that we can identify those gaps to see where we can be proactive. And, and, and utilizing the, you know, the influence that we have as a, as a board. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah it makes sense. And, and just to, um, it, it's, that's a tough one. Um, I think when just listening though, I think what we can really do is we do, I mean, part of our examination process is test, testing for a cultural competency and that's in educational requirements and such now. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think we could maybe look at um, I don't know how we can partner with schools to make sure. I mean, it's already requirements, um, but I'll let, I'd probably let me think about that and definitely figure out how we can. Cultural competency is it the same as or us understanding and being aware that they're getting the knowledge and the education and the training to test for cultural competency? Because if we look at the test yeah. exam rates, and there's a reason why there's a disparity in who's passing it and who isn't. And, and I personally know that the way that test, I have a master's degree in educational psychology. So I understand how tests are created and made and things like that. And if you have questions on there that don't address cultural competency, half of the population that's taken that test, they're, they're, they don't know. They won't be able to answer that. So we have to make sure that the information and the, the questions are relevant and, and you know address cultural competency not for just for one particular demographic but for the masses if you will so 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 i'm not looking at the testing for cultural competency we're looking at education and i would go back to your point um when we look at reducing barriers to licensure it's your second bullet why aren't these people meeting the education requirements where it might be in there somewhere if we aren't aware of you know, and I know we've had this discussion on the board, um, what the exam questions are and things like that. I think we need to dig a little bit deeper in that. So, so first of all, I'm clarifying that we are addressing cultural competency, but maybe we need to look through a lens that's greater than what we already have, because there's obviously gaps there. We want to make sure there, there isn't something that we're missing that we can't address. And so I think I, my comments were further uh, strengthened by what the public comments were. And I'm sure you took good notes there. And so we're addressing the disparity in exam passage rate and things like that. And uh, we also had a good comment on, I'm sorry, let me look at my notes here like you did. Um, the training and forensics for social workers and the incarcerated uh, population, those are just a really good comments that we, I'm not even sure if we're addressing. Um, so those things like that, I think we, we, I'm just reiterating that. I'm hoping that you noted that and bring that in, back into the conversation. Well, I want to follow up what Annette said Thank about you. 
Oh, sorry. I'm done, Susan. Thank you. I, I just want to, the one thing you said was we need to do something now. And I, and I think there, that we do need to do something now to show that we recognize that there's a problem out there. And, and the easiest thing that we could do is what I was suggesting, asking our licensees, people who've already done everything we've asked and they're licensed, to voluntarily list their language and their, their specialty. And I don't see why we can't do that and, and do it now. I mean, obviously we have to bring it before the board and discuss it, but it would be something that we could do now that shows that we have a recognition that there is a major problem and that we are working on it, but here's something that we're doing now. Thank you, uh, Board Member Friedman, and I and I'm sure Steve, um, it's, I'm sure you, uh, you'll include that on the on the list of of things that um, uh, we can consider when the item comes back to us with the short, mid, and and long term strategies. Would that be appropriate? Yes, uh, the the one thing to consider with that proposal too, though, is we have to. It's a matter of um, if bringing some it it's. It's there's definitely a cost and a resource value because we would be able, we would have to have additional staff to kind of man that. Um, so those are the we'll put it on the agenda and we'll talk more about that to kind of see how we can maneuver that in. So. Okay, um, I do have a question, but before I go, I just want to check with board member Uribe if you have any questions. I have some comments. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So um, I was wondering, I know, um, Steve, you mentioned that we're partnering with California Department of Healthcare Access Information and Information, um, that they'll be gathering information. But I was wondering um, if we could also use some of the information we already have, like say that Dr. Sergio, how do you say, Gaxiola, um, has also presented. Um, that's one question. Um, that was for the data analysis. The other thing was on the reducing barriers. Um, I don't know, I had come from, I was like first generation <laughs> college student too, so I can re relate really well to, you know, this conversation and like barriers. But um, I know it seems like a lot of times money is a big issue. I think even having exposure to to even know how to get there. I mean, you know, a lot of the kids that I've worked with, you know, when I was in child welfare, you know, they wanna be like the policeman because sometimes that's who they were surrounded with, the, the policemen and the, the teachers. Um, I know at least going to, when I went to UCLA, a lot of the people I had exposure to were people who had, um, their parents were already professionals and they grew up in their offices you know, doing that thing, you know, and they had, they knew it was already automatic. You're going to go there and this is the money you have saved. And for a lot of the people that I know, you know, you're just trying to survive. <laughs> you're just trying to make sure there's food there, you know, that you have a place to stay. So there's, there's a big, um, a big challenge there. So, and I, I think even like reaching out, you know, I think of, um, I think it's huge to be able to even put that in their minds as young people, because sometimes, like I said, they just don't know. And sometimes people are watching TV. Some people are watching social media, sometimes having that exposure to a mentor. So, I mean, I know our, we have our limitations, but I mean, somewhere along the line, I think that would be kind of awesome to say, hey, have you ever thought of this? And even if it's creating some type of you know pamphlet, or something that can be put somewhere where they can at least put that little seed and hey, contact us or look at this site. So, um, so that's as far as uh, I think it's. I don't know. I think where did I put that? <clears throat> that was a barrier. So, um, and other things. Um, I'm just kind of. I don't know where this would go, but uh, another thing would be. There's programs, and I don't know if this might be something we can do. I know at least with Fresno, they have specializations on working with Southeast Asian populations and Latino populations in mental health. 
and they give you it's actually very good because they talk about um terminology on um, cultural considerations just it's just a whole specialized program and i would be curious to see what other cal states um ucs other programs that are out there what are their specializations and you know that might actually draw someone's attention saying oh my gosh i want to do that i never thought that so um especially i think as our our, our society is changing the um you know i think just kind of letting people know what's out there and what possibilities there are and what resources resources are huge so and and then last things what what next steps can we do as a board um given you know even say given this presentation that was was done earlier so i'm, I'm trying to see how we can connect the dots and that's what I'm hoping um, through our, you know, this is just an initial conversation. So hopefully by the next time we'll get those dots a little more connected. Um, looking at, you know, honestly, the the one thing that we can do, the most immediate thing that we can do is outreach. Um, but even then that's somewhat limited because we do, like I was saying, our audience is not, you know, a high school student or college educated college person going through social work degree program, not necessarily visiting our website. Um, but I think we we do have a, a responsibility to kind of at least demystify um, the profession, um, explain the pipeline better, talk about the different types of mental health professionals, talk about what you know, what's why why would you want to become licensed? What does the licensing do? I think that's one of the immediate things that we can do. It still will take time. Um, and then I like the idea. Um, additionally, uh, not that hopefully people kind of pay attention to our website and social media, but we can also do outreach uh, depending on resources on kind of highlighting, like you said, the specializations in different schools, maybe. I mean, that, that's kind of an idea that might be good. Um, and then HKI data, um, definitely, uh, I haven't had a chance to um, really, there's there's a ton of data and reports out there right now. Um, there's going to be better data for our licensed population soon. I mean, they started collecting it in July, so we're starting to get more of that really fine-tuned demographic data. So we'll be working with them. Um, hopefully it's easy to pull those reports out, but we'll definitely get more data through them. So that's what, the, like I'm saying, this is initial We'll start connecting the dots, um, but just you know, thinking about this really, for us, the immediate response is first of all talking about it. It's on our agenda. We are talking about it. So, I mean, that is that is great. Um, next step, I think, like I said, outreach is probably the quickest thing we can do. What outreach? That's what we're going to have to talk about. Um, it, with keeping in mind, I hate to say it, but the resources we have to produce the outreach because we actually are. You know, we we operate with so many staff, um, but um, some of the outreach activities could be fairly easy. Um, beyond that, then I think you know some of the long term is looking definitely keeping. Um, we we are the long term conversation is going to be on um, a lot of those um, you know pipeline barriers, um, and then also definitely one of the highlights is the, not highlights, but one of the main conversations too, is as we get more information and review it uh, is the exams in that exam process. So um, really that on that exam part too, it's, I think what I'll probably um, try to do on these meetings is um, give you an update on what ASWB is doing and, and what, um, what kind of actions they're taking. And then, um, also, additionally, what we're what actions we are taking, so we can keep track of that. But um, there's a lot of dots to connect. So, <laughs> but I think it's just by us talking about it now and spending the time, it's 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 a start. So, thank you, Steve. Um, let's have a couple of uh, questions or comments. Um, mostly comments. Um, I I think the data piece is going to be really important to kind of inform where we can be most effective. Um, especially with where, um, you know, with where some early uh, and, and easy wins, you know, what things can we do quickly? I think you've heard that from the board to really impact the what's happening now, um, the shortage and the crisis now. Um, 
and then mid and long term goals. And then I, I, I just want to say, uh, you know, I, I am 100% sympathetic with resource and staffing constraints. Um, and I, but I want us to still be uh, creative in trying to figure out how we can meet the need, um, understanding, you know, the purview that we have, the, the budget and the resources that we have, but are there opportunities to collaborate with others and to bring other resources and partners to the table, even our stakeholder groups, um, you know, how can we put something together? You know, if there are areas that we can't get into, how can we encourage others to do it? Or, you know, how can we bring everybody to the table? I, I, you know, this topic is is worthy of kind of bringing all of our, our attention and uh, time to the table and, and seeing what's possible even through, through partnerships and collaboration. Um, so I just kind of wanted to offer that. Uh, do we have any other uh, comments from board members before we go to the public? Okay, um, moderator, do we want to uh, open up public comment, please? Certainly, and we are opening up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. And if you would like to make a comment on this topic, you can look for the question mark icon in the lower right corner of your WebEx screen or behind the three dot other options if you're on a mobile device. In the text box, type comment and click send. The other option is to raise your hand and that is done by the hand icon or if you're on a mobile device, the hand icon is behind the three dot other options or if you are a call in user, you can press star three to raise your hand. Uh, we do have a request for comment from Ben Caldwell. So Ben, I'm going to send you a request to uh, unmute your microphone and you'll have two minutes to speak. And you're unmuted. Good morning. Thank you. Ben Caldwell, LMFT. And I just wanted to briefly express appreciation, Steve, for what you were saying about the uh, the fundamental role of the board, uh, that access to care is a public protection issue. Um, I know it is uh, tempting for uh, not just the BBS, but any licensing board to kind of look at their role as uh, producing ever more stringent standards for licensure and then to do enforcement of the board's rules. Um, when really what the board um, hopefully is focusing on is how can we get the, uh, the best, safest care possible uh, available and present for as many people as possible who need it. Uh, that's a balancing act. I appreciate the work that the board is doing in this regard, and I look forward to seeing uh, what comes out at the next board meeting. Thank you. And the next request for comment comes from someone logged into WebEx as Kathy Atkins. Kathy, I'm going to send your request to unmute and you'll have two minutes to speak. You're unmuted. Hi, this is Kathy Atkins from the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. Um, like other stakeholders, I wanted to thank um, the committee and the BBS for bringing uh, this important issue to the public and stakeholders. Um, I want to to jump on to what Ben just mentioned, and that um, you know I, I I think it's good that it's we're talking about the role of the board um, as well as the resources of the board. Um, you know, certainly if the legislature is tasking the board with additional um, items or priorities, you know, those need to be funded, and how can um, stakeholders assist in in getting money to the BBS to implement what they're being asked to do, if indeed they're being asked to do it. Um, I also want to reiterate what was uh, articulated earlier that, you know, this is a huge issue and it's not just, it shouldn't just fall on the uh, board and the BBS, it falls on the associations as well. And I think most associations are aware of it and are, are are stumped along with, with the BBS on how to solve such a global huge issue. And I also want to um, mention that this isn't just about the BBS and the associations that work with the BBS. It's, you know, Board of Psychology, the Medical Board, um, you know, Department of Insurance. I mean, there's so many um, entities that impact what we're talking about that I, I want to remind us all that this doesn't just fall in this group, this is a much bigger conversation and mountain to climb. 15 seconds. But again, 
I just wanted to say thank you. And our next request for comment comes from someone logged into WebEx as Paige Clark. Paige, I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone and you'll have two minutes to speak. And you're unmuted. Morning, is, yes, thank you. Great. Good morning, this is Paige Clark on behalf of the California Alliance of Child and Family Services. Uh, we represent over 160 nonprofits that employ an array of uh, behavioral health professionals. We really, really deeply appreciate the board's attention to these workforce issues, both in the earlier presentation and the memo that Steve provided an overview of. Um, as we all know, these issues really impact providers' ability to, to provide those crucial services to, to children and families. Um, as discussed, there are multiple barriers in the licensing process that impact all applicants, but especially those from marginalized groups. The Alliance strongly supports the recommendations Steve outlined, specifically waiving exam retake fees, reducing other costs associated with licensure, um, reviewing the exam test rates, and increasing transparency around the licensure process. Um, as Kathy mentioned, we, we would love to be partners in this work. Um, we thank the board for discussing these issues and um, would like to be of support in any way we can. Thank you so much for your time. And our next request for comment comes from someone logged in as Denise Tugade. I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone and you'll have two minutes to speak. And you're unmuted. Um, again, um, <clears throat> echoing uh, the comments of the previous speakers, so appreciative of, uh, of Steve's comments um, and the work that the board has been doing. Um, this is such a critical, uh, critical task and um, really we cannot have quality behavioral health if it's not being provided to all Californians. And so um, I, I should add, Denise Tagata with SEIU United Healthcare Workers, we represent 110,000 uh, allied healthcare workers across the Western United States, including uh, behavioral health workers. Um, and uh, we really hope to be partners as well in this in this task. Disproportionately, our, our membership is made up of uh, communities of color, um, but we also serve communities of color and we want to ensure that, uh, that those communities are getting the patient care that they deserve. And so um, anything we can do to, uh, to improve that, that access, that quality of care um, is so critical. Um, we've seen <clears throat> actually in our work with HCI, with the um, uh, Office of Healthcare Access and Information, that um, there's actually very limited data available around behavioral health. And so um, again, anything we can do to improve that access to data is, is so crucial. So thank you. And our next request for comment comes from a call-in user eight from the 916 area code. I'm gonna send you a request to unmute and you can use star six to unmute yourself. Hello, and you're this unmuted. is Rebecca. Hello, this is Rebecca Gonzalez with the National Association of Social Workers California chapter. I just wanna join others in saying that our association is um, ready to help the BBS on these uh, workforce issues. I wanted to echo the comments made by Paige um, Clark that we have a lot of the same issues that were outlined by Steve as um, barriers to licensure and we think those should all be looked at. Um, and I just wanna thank you for your attention to this matter today. And there are no further requests for comments. Shall I close the Q&A feature? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, are there any additional uh, comments from board members or do we have a motion? I believe there's a recommendation in the report to direct staff to come back with a uh, project plan with some of these short and long-term goals, um, reflecting this discussion and uh, the discussion from item five. Um, 
and happy to make that motion. Or yeah, if somebody else wants to make it, that's good. This is Sabina. You don't you don't have to make a motion for that. The board uh, staff has been taking notes and definitely can. Uh, we'll be working on that and bringing it back based on the discussion. Okay, great. Okay. Um, with that, unless there are any other uh, board member comments, um, we can move on to item four. Uh, the item four is the overview of the purpose of the committee, and I believe we are with Roseanne now. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so we can kind of regroup here, and the, usually we start the meeting with this. So it's a little bit awkward timing, but um, just just um, so a little bit of information to uh, about about the licensing committee. Um, so we've been having the licensing committee for um, a while now um, to discuss several in-depth discussions that need need addressing with our with the licensing process. Um, our last licensing committee was on November of in November of 2021. Um, and then we had a um, we lost several board members that were on the committee. Um, and so uh, it took us a little bit of time to regroup, but now we have regrouped and so um, we're looking forward to moving forward. So um, one of the main things that's come out of this committee already was um, re removing the requirement for the 12 hour California law and ethics course requirement for renewing registrants with a failing California law and ethics exam score. We found that that was actually creating a big barrier and confusion for, for individuals who um, were, were confused about when to take that course. Um, so that requirement was deleted through AB 1759. And instead to ensure public protection, um, the board had decided to require all um, all registrants upon renewal to complete just a three hour um, CE each year in California line. So that went into law on January 1st, so we're moving forward with that. We've had other um, items that we've discussed in this committee, and then we've had other suggestions for um, agenda items that we've put on this list, and uh, probably after today's meeting, we'll regroup and kind of revamp the list a little bit um, to address some new things that have come up. And so as it evolves, we will um, keep adding to the list and, and go from there. Okay, uh, do we have any board member comments on the list or um, potential other items to add other than what was discussed today? Uh, Board member Friedman, is your hand still up from before, or do you have a comment on this one? Oh, all righty. Um, okay, uh, seeing none. So Roseanne, we'll look uh, forward to the um, updated list uh, at the next meeting. Um, do you need to take a public comment on this item? You are absolutely welcome to. Okay. Um, moderator, would you open up the uh, public comment, please? Certainly. And we've opened up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If anyone has any comment on this agenda item, you can look for the question mark icon in the lower right corner of your WebEx screen, type the word comment into the text box and click send, or you can raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon and if you're on a mobile device, your hand icon is behind the three dot other options. And if you are a calling user, you can press star three to raise your hand. And I do not see any requests for comment at this time. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, with that, we'll move on to agenda item six, uh, discussion and possible recommendation regarding the practice of pastoral counseling uh, with Roseanne. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, this is a topic that we discussed previously at our policy and advocacy committee meeting while our licensing committee meeting committee was kind of dormant. Um, we were working on getting some new members. So we originally discussed it um, with along with life coaching, but I've actually split those into two topics because I think that they're going to go in different directions. Um, so in the, with regards to the topic of pastoral counseling, as you all know, the law requires a valid active and license or registration to provide services within the scope of practice of the board's practice act. 
unless somebody's working in an exempt setting or in, or unless they're in a profession that's exempted. And priests, rabbis, and ministers of the gospel of a religious denomination are, are currently exempted. And I've included um, the language exempting them from our, from our practice acts. Um, so you can take a look at that. The language is, is a little bit, bit brief. Um, it doesn't go into a lot of detail. Um, and so the board has occasionally re received complaints or questions or had had some enforcement issues with um, complaints received about an individual who appears to be practicing independently without a license. Um, and they are actually ordained by a religious entity, but they're not performing services as part of their ministerial duties associated with, with a church or something like that. Um, Although it's likely not the intent of the law, the board is typically unable to take disciplinary action um, due to the wording in the law. So the board might wish to consider clarifying the circumstances under which pastoral counseling is exempt from licensure. I went and looked at, at, some, at several other states. Not very many states have any anything in their licensing laws specifically about pastoral counselor. I did find three states, um, two of them are rather large, um, Texas and Florida and then Arizona that have some specific language um, that's a little bit more, that's a little bit more specific. Um, so I wanted to just open the, start the discussion on this and see if, if there's any, any desire to, to update the board's law so it's a little bit more specific regarding um, regarding pastoral counseling and the circumstances under which that is exempted from licensure. So with that, I'll open it up. Thank you. Um, do we have any board member comments or questions? Oh, when Dr. You, Walker. Thank you. Oh. Not, not much on this. Uh, this is really well. Um, spelled out here. Um, so, but based on what you said about uh, under enforcement, where the board has occasionally received complaints, I think that warrants, you know, this discussion actually. So thank you for bringing it forward. And um, given the examples from Texas, Florida, and Arizona, it looks like it's possible to tweak it so that it's a little bit more streamlined um, and clear. Maybe like where that information is located within our uh, written knowledge of this. Um, so I'm, I'm just giving, making comments here. I, I know that you're going to do the work. <laughs> I'm here to support you. So I'm saying yes. Um, let's tweak it a little bit. If and do you have some thoughts about that? I see your examples. Yeah, I I think that um, that the Florida and Arizona. Um, examples are especially especially relevant here. I think that there's a need for some tweaking and I'm not exactly sure how to do it um, to really get the wording down on, you know, the the part where it's talking about um, whether they're working for, for a, um, you know, as part of their regular specialized ministerial duties. I like that language. I don't know if it needs to be made a little bit more specific. So what I'm thinking is maybe I could draft something like a combination of um, Arizona and Florida um, kind of tailored to what we already have. And then we can continue the discussion from, from there. I don't want to have any unintended consequences. We're not really looking to, we're not looking to um, obviously regulate anybody who's, who's doing the work under, under the, you know, as part of as, as their church. Um, but we are we are looking to, to sort of if somebody's out there practicing independently and they've gotten like some kind of online ordained or not really legitimately part of a, a religious organization other than they're paying a fee and and they sort of joined an online one um, that that part is concerning. So it's how to get the wording right so that that loophole sort of goes away. I could agree with you more. And I, I think what you said jumped out to me as well. With Florida and Arizona, I actually underlined those pieces. Maybe that's what, you know, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? Right. And we might want to do some fine tuning. And once we get some language, talk about potential unintended consequences and if anybody has any concerns. Um, because it, it, it is a, a field where, you know, there might be, you know, people practicing under with different employment scenarios for a church. Yeah, we're not 
Right. We don't want to regulate that. Right, right. Like you said, it goes back to the wording. And I totally agree that it's very clear where it says within the scope of the performance of the regular or specialized ministerial duties, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like that piece right there. Yeah, if that addresses the complaints we were getting, then it kind of, there's a match there. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from board members? I, I think my uh, comments or questions were very similar to Dr. Walker's. So. Okay. I, was, I was curious with like occasional and, and even if this is, I would imagine that there's some regulation under, you know, that maybe it can be referred, you know, so I, I'm wondering how often and, you know, if it doesn't fall under us, what, where would it fall? So, and if, if it could be addressed there. Um, if it doesn't, if the, so if, if we got a complaint from somebody that was doing pastoral counseling, in a church and they weren't licensing on we would we would advise them to to make a complaint with to the church there would be no regulatory body in that case unless they were specifically saying that i'm a licensed marriage and family therapist or something like that and they are not um then that would be unlicensed practice because they are saying that they're a licensee of the board when they're not Okay, uh, any other comments or questions on this? Um, Roseanne, do you have um, what you need from us or do you need a motion or? Yeah, I think that the that I have what you need in the motion would be to direct staff to, to draft um, language using Florida and Arizona as an example um, and bring back to the committee for further discussion. Well, could I make that motion? Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Walker. I'd like, like to, to make second. the motion that to direct staff to uh, take further action uh, and recommendations and coming back using Florida and Arizona language to, you know, kind of like verbatim what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Back to the next licensing committee for Roseanne. <laughs> Do we have a second? Not, then I will make the second. Christina, would you please call the roll? I think you need to take public comment. Oh, we need, we need oh, public comment, yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> moderator, would you open up uh, public comment, please? Certainly, we've opened up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If you'd like to make a comment on this issue or the motion, you can look for the question mark icon, type comment in the text box and click send or raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon. We do have a request for comment from Kathy Atkins and Kathy, I will send you a request to unmute your microphone and you'll have two minutes to speak. You're unmuted. Hi, Kathy Atkins from CAFT. Um, I am. Um, I want to speak to this particular issue, but I also um, generally just continue to have confusion, I suppose, about the BBS's authority or any regulatory board when it comes to the unauthorized practice. I certainly understand the authority to regulate those under your, under your um, umbrella, um, but I am confused on the inability to to enforce those who are practicing without a license. Um, and hopefully that could be also discussed in the next section. Um, as to pastoral counseling, while camp doesn't routinely see this as an issue, um, certainly I do think that shoring up um, how um, unlicensed practice in this, uh, in this circumstance um, could be better cited or regulated, I, I camped would support um, we took a look at some of the state's um, language, and I, you know, Roseanne's an expert at at, at editing and drafting. Um, I, our recommendation would be to not tie it to the money at, to to fees, as some do. Um, also, you know, I'm curious how the pastoral uh, associations are, you know, what their thoughts are on all this. But definitely, we would always support um, 
any additional regulation or enforcement ability of those who are practicing without a license and or causing um, any kind of consumer harm um, for a multitude of issues. So thank you very much for this. And I see no further requests for public comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, public comment, a motion and a second. Um, Christina, would you now please call the roll? Since we got it right this time. Yes. <laughs> Rosanna, yes. could I have you construct that motion one more time? Sure. Could I make a comment before we ask? Of course. So um, I guess Kathy had brought up what does the, um, I guess the pastoral counseling, I would, I would just say if maybe there is a way of just consulting, just, I mean, I figure if we're going to put something together, it would be helpful to kind of get their perspective and, um, you know, maybe consider that as it's being drafted. Um, we can reach, we can maybe look at that. I mean, it doesn't really, the, what we're looking at is something that really wouldn't restrict their practice whatsoever. If they're, you know, doing pastoral counseling, what we're kind of the scenario we, we just to put it in perspective, what we look at or what we see occasionally is somebody who's gone through the licensure process, who hasn't finished the licensure process and all of a sudden is doing pastoral counseling and seek and getting money directly from clients. Um, and not, so that's, it wouldn't really put, um, but we can, I'll, we'll look to see maybe, I'm not sure what organizations we would, but there are a couple out there, certification agencies. I'm not, we could try reaching out to them. I'm not sure that what the response would get. It may be a situation where we get, if we were to run a bill, we would get feedback at that time and have to work through the legislative process on the, ex, you know, maybe tinkering it to make it, um, I don't know how how engaged they might be or how to capture all of the potential people who might become engaged ahead of time for this one. Um, but we can definitely try. Okay, um, so then I believe Christina needs the motion restated. Dr. Walker, would you like Roseanne to offer some wording, or do you have one? Well, Jose, let's, think... work, let's work together. So I guess I will start by saying we're directing staff to make uh, any or the necessary changes uh, to the board's statute related to pastoral counseling, uh, utilizing both entities from Florida and Arizona. Yes. Okay. And also to attempt to collaborate with um, some pastoral agencies if they are willing. Okay. Can we can, and to add on what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Is the, the Texas one also going to be considered since there was three states that had something? I'll, I'll, I'll consider the different pieces of that. I think that the Florida and Arizona are a little bit more concise. Um, but yeah, so I'll definitely take Texas into account too. If there's anything in that that might um, might be useful, we definitely won't won't leave that completely out. But I think that the other two are, are just a little bit more worded the way we might want to go to it. Okay, and um, Christina, are we ready for a vote? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Eleanor Uribe? Yes. Wendy Strack? Yes. Susan Friedman? Yes. Annette Walker? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And thank you for keeping us on track there. <laughs> um, all right. So we are on agenda item seven, discussion and possible recommendation regarding the practice of life coaching and the development of a consumer outreach document. Roseanne, this is Thanks. you. Yes, that is me. Um, so we have another piece of this discussion um, that kind of goes along with pastoral counseling is life coaching because life coaching is another thing that it runs 
kind of parallel to the Boards Practice Act, but it's not allowed to be clinical. Um, and so there's some, some confusion out there about what exactly is life coaching? How does it differ from, from the um, board's professions or other mental health professions? Um, where does life coaching start and or end and mental health, um, actually clinical mental health counseling begin? So it raises a number of questions. And we, we provided at the last, at the policy meeting when we discussed this, some articles about the practice of life coaching and what exactly that entails. Um, but the Board's Practice Act specifically do not discuss life coaching. Um, and so the way that our Board's Practice Act define its professions are specifically through um, a code section for each of the profession, professions that we regulate, um, telling what the scope of practice, defining the scope of practice for that profession. Um, and so at the, at the last PNA meeting, Policy and Advocacy Community meeting in early 2022, um, Staff directed um, the staff, the board directed staff to collaborate with the board stakeholders to potentially identify subject matter experts that can maybe draft some consumer outreach materials to be better educate the public and even maybe licensees about where what exactly is um, life coaching. So we we met with representatives from camps, NASW California, and the California Association of School Psychologists or CAST to discuss potentially creating an outreach document from the website. And if the discussion kind of became, if you think that it might need to be a little bit, if staff thinks it might need to be a little bit bigger than just discussing life coaching, this kind of goes into the whole workforce development discussion where we think it might be, be helpful to have a document that's produced by the board that's consumer oriented that contains a description, not just of life coaching, but various other types of regulated and non-regulated mental health professionals, because there's a lot of different ones out there and some are licensed, some are not. Um, some are regulated by this board, some are regulated by other boards, or they're not regulated by a board at all, but they are, they have a certification. Um, and so there's a lot of different, um, different professionals out there and, and there's confusion about what each one does and what the difference is. And also for somebody wanting to get into the field that has an interest, it might be helpful to them as well to, to know about the different types of, of mental health professionals and what sort of skill levels and education levels that each require. So what we, we suggest is that considering making a document that would provide in, provide information about, about various types of mental health professionals, um, who regulates them, um, how to provide, file a complaint with the, important, with the appropriate regulatory entity, or if they're unregulated, um, to point out the lack of regulation. Um, and so we sort of brainstormed a list, and this is I know that this is not going to be all inclusive. There's many different ones that will probably need to be added, but we brainstormed a list of various um, individuals that might be included in, in a document the board might create as outreach. So if the committee chooses to proceed with the document, um, we would probably need a subject matter expert with, with really specific mental health expertise in this area to draft it. Um, and then once the draft was complete, staff could bring it back to the committee for discussion and fine tuning. Um, so wanna discuss the possibility of doing that. Um, and also if the, if the um, committee wants to do that, if, if we are open to suggestions on, on maybe how to find an appropriate subject matter expert to do that as well. That's all from my end for now. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a quick um, comment on that. Um, I think the, the document's helpful, um, but wanted to also communicate that, uh, you know, think especially um, you know, the next generation um, tends to like more video or audio or action oriented um, outreach. And so if we can incorporate some of that into this. So if, you know, if this can also be helpful in a workforce development, you know, arena where explaining the difference between the professions, what requires licenses, what doesn't, I mean, it could be useful in a school setting as well. So maybe incorporate some of some elements that um, can be helpful in that setting. Um, I wanted to also any other comments from board members? Uh, Dr. Walker. 
Yeah, I, I like your comment, what you just said. That's really, really strategic. Um, but my thought is I, I totally am on board with subject matter, subject matter experts at any point in time. However, we were just talking about prioritizing monies and spending. So is there a cost associated with doing so? With this particular document? Yes, there is. Uh, I would go ahead, Steve. Yeah, you're gonna probably refer to me. <laughs> um, there is a cost. I mean, but it's very it's it, looking at the time amount uh, involvement where we need the subject matter expert, it would be pretty minimal. I mean, I think Usually what we, how we work with that as subject matter expert, as we've done before in some of the other committees is, um, you know, we, we present material and it's not necessarily they have to go research and grab stuff, but it's just really to have somebody there to kind of look it over who is a professional in that field to say, it looks, that looks good to me. Um, so it, it'd be really minimal cost. We can almost like a peer review, if you will. Yeah. Kind of like a peer review. You do the work. Okay. Um, with that so you don't have to give me the so is this a practice common practice with bbs i'm still somewhat new here but in using subject matter experts so we have a pool that we can easily and quickly refer to so yeah out. subject subject matter experts i mean we use for various uh, enforcement process we use them for the exam development um, and it's really, you know, usually the way we, we, we seek, this one's a little bit different. We haven't done this in a while. So it's really trying to find a, somebody, first of all, I think what we're happy to define is definitely what we want each subject matter to look, subject matter expert to look at. Cause I think we're the way I'm thinking, we might need to get uh, separate ones for each license type just to kind of look at that. Um, and then we reach out and I think it might behoove us to maybe the associations definitely have maybe some people they could um, actually recommend. Um, and then, yeah, and so it's, we haven't done it where we've reached out in a while like this. It's not a, it's not a big, it's not a, my, it, the process is not laborious or it's, it's pretty easy. Okay, so it's, it's, it's kind of a one and done sort of. Sorry. Was that oh, you sorry. Recording? Yeah, it's kind of a, a one a one time project versus sort of an on you know collecting and analyzing data and preparing reports for for each board meeting. Um, that would be a more you know under undertaking. If we were to add a position for something like that, that would be more of an under a, a ongoing undertaking. And this is kind of a one time. Hey, can you help us produce this report? Is I think what we're trying to say. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll come back after the vote. We are voting on this, correct? Yeah. Okay. And then uh, board member Friedman also has some comments. Susan, I think you're, you might be muted. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just curious how many complaints we've received about this and what they are. Steve, I'll let you speak um, to that. Yeah, we, uh, I mean, we receive complaints occasionally. Um, it's, it's not, you know, it's not a huge amount of the complaints we're getting, um, but we do get complaints about life coaching. Um, and honestly, I think some of them, is, it's usually the, uh, other licensees um, com uh, kind of not sure what, you know, so-and-so over here is, is a life coach, but I'm not sure that it seems like they're doing something that they shouldn't. So, um, it's not, I don't really, you don't really hear too much from uh, actual clients themselves, but, um, but I mean, it's, it's not fairly common, but we do get complaints. The one thing too, though, is I, I want to make sure that we understand that it is, I mean, life coaching is, is definitely necessary out there. It's another aspect of the mental health, you know, workforce. So we, we don't want to limit anybody who is a life coach out there. It's just, so that's why it's, Instead of that's, I think where we're in this light here is instead of uh, trying to, you know, create new regulations of such, you know, let's let's just educate so that people know how to make the choice, a good choice of whether they want, need a life coach or if they need actual therapy. So, well, the only thing that concerns me is that if people are going to rely on a life coach. Maybe there should be some licensing for life coaches. I don't know. There's a certificate. There's a certification, actually. 
for some of, they do have a certifying agencies. So there's some, okay. yeah, so, but no, nothing, no, um, no professional licenses yet. Uh, any other board comments or questions? Seeing none, uh, moderator, would you open public comment, please? Certainly, and we're opening up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If you'd like to make a comment on this topic, you can look for the question mark icon, typically in the lower right of your WebEx screen or behind the three dot other options if you're on a mobile device. Type the word comment and click send. The other option is for everyone to, is to raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon and calling users can press star three to raise their hand. Each speaker will have two minutes to speak. And I see a request for comment from Ben Caldwell. Ben, I'll send you a request to unmute and you'll have two minutes to speak. And you're unmuted. Good morning, thank you. Ben Caldwell, LNFT. I have my own questions and concerns when it comes to life coaching and consulting and related professionals, but I'm not convinced yet that this is a good use of board resources. You know, the board is certainly within its scope to discuss the boundaries of where therapy ends. But once the board starts discussing or seeking to define to the public professions or activities that are outside of BBS jurisdiction, I think that naturally raises some flags as it should. Um, in addition, if the board produced a document that serves to encourage consumers to seek services from a board licensed professional instead of services from another kind of professional, assuming that other professional isn't breaking any law, then it might be seen as the board operating more like a guild to protect its licensees, and that also would raise some flags. Um, I think the, the question about data here is a good one. It would be helpful to see just how many complaints come in about this kind of thing. Um, but it would seem to me that the best way to address concerns would be to enforce existing practice protection law um, rather than using board resources on a document that um, probably wouldn't be all that widely read and would also raise some questions about the board's role and jurisdiction. Thanks. And our next request for comment is from Kathy Atkins. Kathy, I'll send you a request to unmute and you'll have two minutes to speak. Hi, this is Kathy. This is Kathy Atkins from CAF. Thank you. Um, I, I too, um, encourage and and question um, whether the use of the practice protection law. You know whether it's as I stated earlier. I'm a little confused if, if it's statutory written in a way that the BBS is unable to use it, or is it challenging or um, you know, if and when complaints do come that revolve around um, the unlawful practice of psychotherapy, um, my understanding is it's a challenge to pursue action. So I am hopeful that that discussion continues because that seems like a viable solution. As for the education um, resources, I understand and support that. I, I um, I, I do agree that it needs to be um, written in a manner that's not advocate, advocacy-ish, but I, I don't foresee that the BBS would be writing it that way. Um, if it were, I could see the problems, but I, I don't suspect that's how it will be written. So I, I do um, support the education materials, but I don't know that that's a cure-all. Um, so I am hopeful in the future that there can be more discussion on how to utilize the practice protection law um, that is out there. Thank you. And I see no further requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, following public comment, uh, do you have any additional board comments or thoughts or questions? Yeah, this is Dr. Walker. Um, I, I, I too have a concern about investing in this particular 
aspect the way it's been recommended by the board, it seems like we can do this, even if this is a minimal cost. Some of the things that we spoke to earlier, it seems like there was a hesitation to even have the conversation because we don't have the money. But this to me is maybe on our list of, of priorities is, is, is not as high as some of the others that were mentioned earlier when we're looking um, at barriers, reducing barriers and things like that uh, for licensing exams and stuff and um, looking at education and cultural competency and the, you know, so um, my concern is, is, is the cost here. I think we can do the work, but I'm not um, for investing uh, money into this. That's just a concern and a comment from me. Yeah, I can, can I speak to that or just really quick to kind of, yeah, the cost would be, it would be a minimal cost. And what, um, what we're looking at kind of this, what uh, Roseanne had said, this kind of goes over into two things, kind of the workforce development too. Um, and honestly, I think, I don't know if when we started talking about this, I, I'm kind of a proponent for it. First of all, we wouldn't be advocating for a certain type of uh, professional out there or provider. Um, that would be one thing. We wouldn't do advocacy for that. Um, and when I talk about resources, some of the, what I was, when I talk about, you know, going out and advocacy and getting out there, we need actually bodies to do that. Um, so that's kind of where the resources and the cost where I've kind of hesitance on. This one is not, it's something that I think can actually serve two purposes. Looking at, actually the bigger purpose is assisting with people looking at that pipeline to licensure or, you know, what it is to be a mental health professional. And I think it's the conversations I've uh, the conversations I've been in and have presentations I've listened to kind of what um, capitalizing on um, on Eleanor's comments. Uh, it's you know really getting a some sort of document out there. Unfortunately, our audience is limited, but hopefully we can use this to actually explain to people that might be wanting to get in to a, you know mental health profession where they can help out in this situation. And really for them, it is would be a minimal cost to us. It's not a major resource drain to do something like this, um, but I think it could actually be utilized, you know, in our in our outreach efforts, it could be very good, so. Well, well Steve, what you just said is kind of like different than what was somewhat presented here. We started focusing on the practice of life coaching. What you just mentioned was developing a comprehensive outreach or guide that um, on the pipeline to licensure and mental health, uh, the mental health profession. So I guess you're referring to the bullets there of that exhaustive list there. So it's not just focusing our subjectmatic experts to life coaching to so bring clarity to the community of what that is or what it isn't. And we're, so I'm a little confused now. So what what is the recommendation for this doc on this document? Is it a comprehensive so, document or one that just focusing on life? No, it's a comprehensive, like what um, Roseanne has put in there, basically the idea is to, because right now if you, is to give an explanation of all the mental health professionals that are out there, give you an idea of what they provide, what services they can provide. And then additionally for our licensees, you know, um, explaining, um, you know, what they can provide and then where to seek services if, or, you know, where to complain to, I mean, not necessarily complain to, but if you have an issue, this is where you could go. So we're, it's a comprehensive, basically an explanation, a dictionary of, you know, all the mental health professionals out there. And what I'm talking about is then leveraging this document to go even further and to use it as, um, you know, if we have, this is where the resources come in. If we get, if I have enough staff or resources, then maybe we can look at taking this document and presenting it at community-based organization. Like if they have uh, education days or something, we can go there and say, hey, we're here, we're the board, here's something to look at, let's let's help you out. Because right now, I, I feel like if you went to our, if you went to our website, to look for information if you're or if you typed up a google search saying you know licensed mental uh marriage and family therapists and you went to our website and we're wondering what does a marriage and family therapist do i think all we have on there is the scope of practice which is legalese and it's not going to really tell you anything and 
it doesn't assist the consumer or somebody doing, you know, somebody looking at the profession itself. So I think it's a minimal resources, but we could leverage something like this quite efficiency, efficiently, I think. Okay, well, that's my, that's that was helpful. my take on it. Yeah, that's helpful. I'm glad you elaborated because it seemed like we got, in my mind, we were kind of focusing on one particular area, not looking at the bigger picture. So that makes sense to me. Um, and so now I'll let others speak and then, and then have some other comments later. I can, can I jump yeah, in I here really quick? I have two different suggestions. If, if the committee feels it's premature to do more of a comprehensive document at this time, um, I have a couple, a couple of different thoughts. Um, one, we could start out small and just provide maybe a consumer focused, maybe we could consult with our associations and, and have them provide a, you know, a consumer focused paragraph of what their profession does sort of in a nutshell that's aimed toward the consumer to make it compile those and have the committee review it obviously because um, the board would be presenting it. Um, and we could start small and then see what the feedback is on that. The other suggestion is we did, we started this topic. So we've been talking about this topic for a, a while now of, of life coaching. It's kind of evolved in this. It's kind of evolved separately from our workforce development top, topic, which we're now just sort of kicking off. So, so they're kind of on two different kind of colliding paths. So one other possibility was we've talked a lot in the, um, in the, for the workforce development action plan today, we're going to be co compiling an action plan. Um, you know, maybe this fits into that somewhere or as part of another doc, an outreach document we might start doing. We've said we want to do more outreach um, on some of these things. So maybe we hold on it for now and see where it, it circle back when we, when we get more into the details of the workforce action plan and see, see where, if anywhere, it belongs. So those would be two other suggestions. Either. Oh, this is, on that, oh. If no one else has their hand raised. Yes, this is Dr. Sabina, Parker, go ahead. Okay, that's a really good idea, Roseanne, because it sounds like we're working on an action plan versus a comprehensive document when it could be more streamlined. So I really appreciate what you just said. And before we invest monies in this document that would be like, again, minimal, a minimal investment, we may not need it at all. if. What you said by taking a small a first step and just gathering the information to see what we need because if i was unclear about what we're investing in now i would not like for us to go out and spend the money and come back and that's not what the what this committee was really you know needing or asking for so i do appreciate your your thoughts there that would be my motion if, if it's time to make one and sabina were you trying to weigh in I was, I was just going to um, chime in here that this type of outreach, outreach document and discussion and um, examination of life coaching is a really important consumer protection part of the board because there is a lot of confusion out there about life coaches and possibly how consumers may want to engage with a life coach or licensee and they, and they really should know the difference. And it is important for us to examine that um, to help protect our consumers and educate them as well as um, you know other licensees and who, who might be interested in doing some type of life coaching versus some type of services that are, are licenses required. So I think this is a good discussion and um, potential outcome for our consumers and, and as well as our licensees to provide some guidance. Thank you, Sabina. I, again, this is Dr. Walker, public member. I agree with that, but I, the, our work here is, is to effectively place this information where it's better consumed by our public. So where does this information live? And it could be in that workforce action plan if it has that much weight and priority rather than a, a quick outreach brochure where there's just a blurb on it. I do believe I heard Steve mention that this is a, it fits into the workforce action plan. So, and, and also protecting our consumers and consumer care. So maybe it's a bigger piece than where, than, and it should live with that action plan, like Roseanne was saying. Okay, are there any other comments from other board members? Okay. 
If not, um, Dr. Walker, do you want to make a recommendation or? Sure, I'll let me um, take a stab at making a motion. Again, Roseanne, jump in with me. Um, so the motion would be to direct staff to move forward with collecting uh, data from the um, various stakeholders to get perhaps a, a, a blurb, a quick paragraph, and create that as a comprehensive um, document to bring back to this committee for further discussion and clarity before we invest monies into uh, bringing in subject matter experts. It, we'll see if it's needed or not. But then to also look at um, staff looking at uh, integrating life coaching into the workforce action plan. Is that, is that pretty clear or help me? Um, so I guess my question would be, do you want us to, to just start with, with the four professions that we regulate? Or do you want us to, to try to reach out to associations for, for the various other professionals? I'm gonna ask Steve to chime into this because I'm saying hold off on the recommendation as, as it is written here. We're bringing in subject matter experts and start. We're just gathering data. Okay. You all can decide you know, where to go from there. And But I think we distinguished that list and where life coaching fits in as well. And I think that's important to me as a committee member here. All, it's all important to me, but Steve, <laughs> you can and staff can work on where you're going to collect the, the data. Um, so. Because I, I see your list here. Is that what you're yeah. asking? Yeah. Yeah, I think that kind of my intent was that like for some of these other professions that, that are outside that are mental health, there's not some of them might be a little bit more difficult for us to reach out with, to without a subject matter expert kind of knowing in general, and you're having co contacts with sort of these fields. Um, so I'm a little bit unsure how to go about it. I would I would say maybe we start with our professional associations and then look at integrating the life coaches and the uh, some of the other mental health professionals into outreach documents that might be generated from the workforce action plan. Yes, this is separate. Again, I'm not in, in, you know, it depends on what Steve and staff's <laughs> what your plan is for this comprehensive document. Mm -hmm. What you're, you know, what you're, what you were recommending today. That's a, to uh, me, that's a, that's a little bit different. We've kind of changed the, the scope of that. Right. So but, I think that what I would recommend is that we reach out to the, the four professions that the board licenses. Um, to come up with kind of a comprehensive description of the four professions the board regulates and then discuss as part of the workforce development action plan you know and when we're doing our goals for that would a more integrated document um be more be helpful and fit into that at that time with the other profession th that are outside of the board's purview and, and I think that that would be good probably because then we can kind of give you an example of what we're looking at or thinking about and how that would be presented. And then we can continue on, you know, if it's something we want to, you know, move forward on, we can do that. Okay, thanks for chiming in, Steve. So is that motion clear then? Let me actually, it's not really clear if I can so, kind of get a constructive motion out of that. And who's you got it, Roseanne. Do you want <laughs> this is Christina? Do to, oh, okay. Annette, do you want me to re try to restate it? Yes. Yeah, please, if you don't mind. Um, so the motion would be to direct staff to move forward with collecting data from the boards for um for from stakeholders with stakeholders representing the boards for licensed professionals and create use that to create a comprehensive document. Um, with with information provided from them and bring that to back to the licensing committee for discussion. And then to also, as part of formulating the workforce development action plan, um, consider whether integrating other professions as part of outreach materials um, would be helpful. Sounds like what I said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, Roseanne. We make a great team. Yes, definitely. Is that helpful? <laughs> Does that work, Christina? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? 
Uh, uh, board member Uribe, saw your hand first. Um, then uh, moderator, would you open up public comment, please? Certainly, and we are opening up the WebEx Q&A to facilitate public comment. If you have any comment on the motion or the issue, you can look for the question mark icon, typically in the lower right of your WebEx screen. Type the word comment in the text box and click send. Anyone can also raise their hand to request to be recognized for public comment, and you can click on the hand raise icon to do that. Each speaker will have two minutes to speak and call-in users can press star three to raise their hand. And we have a request for comment from someone logged in to WebEx as GK. I do not see him in the traditional list, so it might be a call-in, but would the chair like me to read the comment out loud? Uh, sure. Uh, as they do not have a connection with a microphone, uh, the comment is, are life coaches and its organizations included in the development of this process? And that is the only public comment that I see at this time. Shall I close the public comment? Yes, please. Thank you. And if you'd like, I can address that question. Sure, that would be great. Um, Thank you. The answer to that question would be no. At this point, live coaches would not be included in the development of the document. Um, it would be the the professional associations um, that that represent um, the board's licensed professionals. We would ask them to to submit a short description of um, for for cons consumer a consumer forward description of what their profession does. Um, and then the board would compile that into a, a document, uh, one comprehensive document of the board's professions that would be kind of a, a document for consumers to, to know the difference between an LMFT, an LEP, an LPCC, and an LCSW. Thank you. Um, so we have a motion and a second, assuming no changes. Uh, Christina? We uh, do the vote. Yes. Is Susan still here or did she leave? Uh, sorry, no, Susan, Susan left. Okay. Sorry. Um, Wendy Strat? Yes. Eleanor Uribe? Yes. Dr. Annette Walker? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, suggestions for future agenda items. Do we have any um, suggestions from board members? Uh, seeing none, um, to, uh, let's open up public comment in case there are any uh, suggestions for future agenda items from the public. Certainly, this is the moderator and we're opening up the Q&A feature of WebEx to facilitate public comment. If you have suggestions for future meeting agenda items, you can look, uh, look for the question mark icon, type the word comment and click send or raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon and call in users can press star three to raise their hand. And I do not see any requests for public comment at this time. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next on the agenda is public comment for items. Oh, can I say something? Oh, of course. Yes. I, don't, I don't know if this is something we would do, but mentoring, <laughs> even along the process to get a license, I don't know if that would some, be something we could talk about. We can certainly add that as a future agenda item and we can work with staff on what that looks like. Sure. Does staff need any clarification on that or? I know, I'll reach out. Okay, good. Okay, um, next is a public comment for items not on the agenda. Um, as a reminder, the board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during 
this public comment section except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda at a future meeting. Uh, do any board members have comments on items not on the agenda? Seeing none, um, let's open up public comment uh, for any audience members that may have comments for items not on the agenda. And this is the moderator. We are reopening the Q&A feature to allow for uh, suggestions for items that were not on today's agenda. If anyone has any suggestions, you can look for the, Q the question mark icon, type comment and click send or raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon. And we do have a request for comment from Kathy Atkins. Kathy, I'll unmute you and you'll have two minutes to speak. You're unmuted. Hi, this is Kathy Atkins from Camp. Um, I'm hopeful that, um, and I, I suspect we'll see it on the agenda in the future future uh, meetings, but I am hopeful that a conversation continues about um, examinations, um, the national exam usage by California. I recognize, Camp recognizes there are some stumbling and hurdles um, regarding different aspects of standardized testing um, generally, and that, you know, I think that those need to be addressed. Um, and there's also a continuing and growing conversation about not just license portability, but positions within the federal government and on the federal level that um, do require exams, specifically um, the national exam. And so uh, CAMP will be um, reaching out to the BBS in the future on this issue, but I just wanted to put on the public record that, you know, we're hopeful we do see this conversation continuing. Thank you. And I see no further requests for public comment. Shall I close the comment bar uh, feature? Thank yes, you. thank you. Okay. Um, that brings us to our last agenda item, adjournment. Um, thank you for everybody for being here today. Happy New Year. I know this is a long meeting, so thank you to uh, committee members and stakeholders for uh, excellent participation and, and patience for the length of the meeting. So um, our board meeting will be February 2nd and 3rd, and we will see you all then. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year again. Thank you, everyone.